This episode of Top Guns features three iconic, standard-issue military rifles. The M1 Carbine, a radical new semi-auto designed for its day. The M14, the U.S. Army's primary battle rifle at the beginning of the Vietnam War. And the Red Army's Mosin Nagant, a rugged bolt-action rifle used as a primary weapon in wars for eight decades. Throughout history, weapons, both primitive and modern, have been essential for survival. Used on the field of battle, for hunting, law enforcement, and personal protection. As technology advances, rifles, shotguns, and pistols are continually improved to be more precise and effective. On every episode of Top Guns, experts and marksmen will delve into the history, mechanics, and design of these weapons. After being field tested, they will be featured in a shoot-off to determine which weapons truly are the Top Guns. On this episode, we're looking at military rifles, and we've got the perfect expert here to help. Gary James. Hey. How are you doing today? Fantastic. Good to see you. Good to see you, sir. Well, before we get to the guns, tell me a little bit about your background in terms of firearms. Oh, gosh. I've, I've been shooting and collecting guns since I was about 9 or 10 years old. Gary James joined the military in his youth and served as an ordnance officer stationed in South Wales, UK. For 40 years, he's been shooting and writing about guns, especially historical weapons, and is currently the editor of Guns and Ammo magazine. What guns do you have for us today? Hi, we got some cool stuff. First of all, one of my all-time favorites, the M1 carbine. All right. The M1 carbine, it's a real good entry-level gun, and I've always enjoyed shooting it. It's just a lot, a lot of fun. Then we have the gun I trained with in the Army, the M14, great, great, great battle rifle. One of the all-time best, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, another semi-auto. I like it. Yep, yep. Then, just to keep things a little different, certainly one of the most historic military bolt actions ever, the Russian Mosin Nagant. Going old school, huh? We are going seriously old school. 1891, this thing came in. Bolt action. Uh, bolt action. Two semi-autos and a bolt action, all right. They're all military rifles. Two US and a Russian. Mosin was obviously the earliest. Number one, two, and three. OK. This came in 1891, this 1941, this came in the 50s. All right, let's start with the M1 carbine. At the start of World War II, thousands of US troops were in need of firepower. And American manufacturers stepped up in a major way with the M1 carbine. These lightweight, defensive weapons were rushed into mass production as America prepared for battle. 10 major contractors actually retooled their assembly lines for this massive effort, including Rockola, a jukebox manufacturer, Inland Corp, a division of General Motors, U.S. Postal Meter, and the Underwood Typewriter Company. The parts were all interchangeable, made separately, and assembled later, which sped up wartime production. Yeah, you had back then, in World War II, you had sewing machine factories, everybody, oh, everybody that could, was doing. could machine was making equipment, weapons, Absolutely. jeeps, everything we needed for the war. Yeah, and they had 1,600 subcontractors making small parts for these things. What size cartridge is this? 30 caliber carbine. It's virtually a pistol round. So, but this, it's not a large enough cartridge that this would ever be considered a main battle rifle. No, and, and it's like in, in the Korean War, for example, uh, a lot of the troops are complaining that uh, the, the bullet wasn't powerful enough to punch through the, the Chinese quilted jackets. Well, let's bring in today's shooter. Every week, we invite a marksman to the range to test the weapons and give us a practical perspective on these firearms. This time, it's Mike Seeklander. He's the director of training at the United States Shooting Academy in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Served in the Marine Corps. He's also worked as a US Air Marshal. He's also competed with everything from handguns to high-powered rifles. Mike Seeklander. Mike, Gary James. Nice, nice to meet you, man. Here's what I want you guys to do. Take each one of the guns down to the range separately. And ultimately, we want to create a report card on these guns, OK? 
put them through their paces. Start off with the carbine. I'll okay. come down there and check on you guys. Great. Okay, Sounds have some fun. Thanks. The M1 is a light, it's a rugged rifle. You can tell it was made for one purpose and that was combat. Our marksman and expert will test all three weapons. Then I'll join them on the range for a friendly shoot off. First up, the M1 carbine. You know, Mike, one of the cool things about this particular gun is mm -hmm. it was actually purchased from a veteran who had it at Iwo Jima. Really? So it's a real World War II gun. A real it's deal. a heck of a nice gun, yeah. I've always been a historian, and part of the thrill of shooting any gun with me is the history that goes along with it. The M1 carbine has an ingenious design for staging the ammunition. When the gun is fired, gases are produced that propel the bullet out of the barrel. Some of these gases are tapped off and forced into a little hole in the barrel. This pressurized gas activates a short piston that ejects the spent cartridge and simultaneously chambers another round. The short gas piston design was developed by a man named David Marshall Williams. In 1921, Williams ran an illegal steal in North Carolina. During a raid by law enforcement, a deputy sheriff was killed. Williams was sent to prison for 20 years. After some time in a chain gang, they allowed him to work in the machine shop where they made license plates. In his off hours, Williams began making parts for guns. He tinkered with the short piston ejection system. Amazingly, the warden took note of his skills and permitted him to continue. In 1929, the governor reduced his sentence and he was released. Now free to fully develop his rifle, he was granted a US patent award for the short piston design. He joined forces with the engineers at Winchester and completed work on the M1 carbine. Why don't you go ahead and, and let's see, we, let's sight the thing in. I'll spot for you. Sounds good. Right. The first thing we tried to do was get the gun zeroed and find out where it was shooting. And when I say zero, that's probably a misterm because there's not much you can do on this gun. There's not a dial or something you can dial on the sights and change the point of impact. Since not all guns shoot straight, marksmen must zero the gun, aim at the bullseye and see where their shots actually hit then make an adjustment to be more accurate. So you're low and to the right. You're in the nine ring at about uh, 11 o'clock. All right. You're getting right in there. Nine ring at about uh, seven. After we zeroed the gun, we realized that we need to be holding to the left to hit relative center or get hits on the target, which is what I tried to do. This was this was your first shot? Yep. And then I think this was your second, yeah. and finally yeah. your third. Yeah, my hold off was uh, almost exactly corresponding to that. So my hold off was somewhere right, right up here. here. Yeah, OK. Yeah. The gun shot low to the right, so we aimed high to the left. Let, let's do this. Let's let's go down range. Let's say we're, we're using this rifle like it was probably used a lot, close mm -hmm. range. Let's go down right, to 10 sure. or 15 yards, pick a bullseye, and I'll square up and get in a real good combat platform like we would teach nowadays and see how fast we can get hits in that bullseye. If it's a combat rifle, unless it's a precision rifle that's meant to be used long, long range, then I'm gonna have to have the ability to shoot fast follow-up shots. The M1 is the greatest unsung hero of World War II. Because of its lightweight and increased firepower, this weapon had a huge impact on the outcome of the war. In February of 1945, during the Battle of Iwo Jima, American Marines stormed 20,000 entrenched Japanese soldiers on the island. Marines carrying 70 pounds of gear traded their 11-pound Garand battle rifles for the 5-pound M1 carbine with double the firepower. The M1 had a 15-round magazine, the Garand just eight. The fighting lasted more than four weeks. In this iconic picture of the Marines raising the flag over Iwo Jima, the soldier is holding an M1 carbine. So I'd square up and probably center the gun somewhere on the chest here and see what the recoil control on the gun is like. Just like in combat, right? Yep. And I messed my sights up there. Wow. 
Wow, that uh, the gun recovers well. You did speed. just fine, absolutely. The shots are still in that eight inch circle that we talked about that would be combat exactly. effective in a, uh, at a 15 yard target. So. Yeah. Overall, the M1 carbine would probably get about a B or a B minus in my opinion. There's some great things about it and there's some things that I think could be better. Obviously, I'm taking into account the M1 was designed a long time ago for a specific purpose. Thanks a lot. It was a lot of fun. It does well. We'll shoot the other guns. If I had to guess, I'm going to guess that I probably am not going to choose this gun in the, in the long run, but we'll see. Three military rifles, the M1 carbine, the M14, and the Mosin Nagant. But before we get back to the range, some historic bullet points. Each of these military rifles is built around a wooden stock that seats against the shoulder. A hardwood like walnut is a favorite for gun stocks, but other woods are used, including maple, myrtle, birch, and mesquite. The grain of the wood should flow lengthwise from the barrel to the butt. Perpendicular grain weakens the stock considerably. We've tested the M1 carbine, and the grade is in. The M1 carbine would get about a B, or a B minus in my opinion. Next up, the M14 battle rifle. All right, Gary, let's move on to one that I know you're partial to. Yep. The M14. One of my favorite guns. I suppose any uh, GI is, you know, they're always partial to the gun they train with, but this is a darn good gun in its own right. The M14 was the most dangerous predator in the Vietnamese jungle during the war. In the 1950s, the U.S. Army needed a new battle rifle in their arsenal. After reviewing several proposals, in July 1959, they decided upon a weapon from the Springfield Armory and designer John Garand, the M14. It fired a powerful 7.62 cartridge with a lot of knockdown power. The M14 became a favorite of the ground troops. This is what almost all the guys in Vietnam went to basic with, right? Basic yeah, I, I certainly did. Yeah, um, my dad and, did. Yeah. This is what he used. It was basically intended to be an improvement on the grand, which is what it is. There's a lot of parts that are common. I mean, the trigger group's very close, and the, you know, and the, the rotating bolt, uh, the sight's identical. Uh, but the big thing is it's got a 20-round box magazine. It's a little lighter. What was this thing? Well, when these things were firing full auto, you kind of rested that on top of your shoulder and it's supposed to give you more stability. Of course, it didn't, yeah. you know? The problem was the gun weighed, you know, nine pounds, a half pound less than the Garand, but in full auto, it was uncontrollable. In the jungles of Vietnam, the enemy could hide anywhere, and the flash from a gun barrel might mean a targeted death. The long slots on the end of the M14 serve to capture and suppress the muzzle flash produced when a rifle is fired. The flash hider helps soldiers to avoid revealing their position as they fire on the enemy. Well, then, and ultimately, this thing got replaced by the M16, but there are a lot of guys that didn't want to give this up, well, right? I, I, I'd certainly much rather have it. Really? It's, it's, it's a great gun. It really is. Handy, reliable, super accurate. You know, they've got... Yeah, what's the effective range on this gun? You know, I'm probably around 600 meters, somewhere around wow. there. So this could have been used even uh, in a There's, sniper application. They're, they're the using gun. them right now in sniper rifles in, wow. in uh, the Middle East. They use these in competition, and they do very, very, very well. Well, Gary, let's bring Mike back in here so you guys can get down to the range. OK. Mike, take the M14 down there, burn some rounds through it. But remember, a little later, the three of us are going to have a friendly little shoot off. All right? Have fun. I had great expectations for the M14, because I knew I know it's a great gun. I knew it's, it would shoot well today. The only thought was, where is it going to be zeroed, and are we going to have to hold off or change the sights on the, on the gun? You're going to do 6 o'clock? Yes, sir. I think we'll do 6 o'clock holder. Gary had a great idea and said, hey, let's use a 6 o'clock hold, which is a little bit more precise for zeroing a gun. Rather than have the front side in the center of the, of the black, which you know could vary, you're not really sure if you're directly in the center, that bottom edge of that circle is very precise. Not too shabby. Seven o'clock cutting the ten ring. Seven o'clock cutting the ten ring. Yep. X ring. X ring. Here, I don't believe we're going to need to do much to zero this gun. I don't think we want to fool around with it. Put a couple more in there. Yeah. I'm not even going to shoot. It's going to make me look bad. 
Yeah, this is uh, excellent. Ah, X-ray. I love this gun. The M14 performed beautifully, as expected. So we thought we'd just go ahead and do some close range shooting, rapid firing, and see what it did. We'll do that same test we did yesterday. We'll get, you know, standing position. So now we've got to contest with the weight just a little bit of the gun and, okay. and the recoil control. And uh, let's let's rip off 20 rounds each. OK, 20 yeah. rounds. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we got we gotta have, we got to have fun here. OK, yeah. <laughs> All right. I was envisioning the toughness of some of these veterans that were taking this large, heavy rifle and charging up a small hill, only to get there with a screaming heart rate maxed out and having to get into a position and put rounds on target to save themselves or their buddies. I envy and have a tremendous amount of respect for those gentlemen that had to carry that particular gun and accomplish that mission. Here we go. That's about as good as you can get. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you got in a gunfight uh, with this big bad boy at this range, it'd be very successful. Oh, absolutely. The gun is very, very controllable. You know, it's such a large and powerful caliber. It's impressive, and that's one of the things I like about this gun. If I had to grade the M14, I'm going to give that gun a solid A. In the final shootout, if I get the M14, I'll be very happy. We're testing three classic battle rifles, the M1 carbine, the M14, and the Mosin Nagant. Though these weapons have been mothballed by the military for decades, a new generation has learned to appreciate them in the virtual world through video games. There's only one military rifle left for historian Gary James and former Marine Mike Seeklander to examine. The M1 carbine and M14 have already been tested and graded. Now it's time for the legendary Mosin Nagant, shouldered by Russian peasants and later Soviet troops against Nazi Germany. All right, moving on to our last one, the Mosin Nagant. Mosin Nagant, one of the most famous, influential, important, bold action military rifles in history. The Mosin Nagant was the muscle behind the Red Army's might. It was co-designed by Sergei Mosin, a Russian officer, and Leon Nagant, a gunsmith from Belgium. They were first used in the Boxer Rebellion in China. Then, in 1914, the Imperial Russian government, desperate for rifles to fight World War I, ordered 1.5 million to be produced by the Remington Arms and Westinghouse Corp in the US. In 1917, with only half the order completed and not paid for, the new communist regime stopped payments to any Western company making the Mosin Nagant. Remington and Westinghouse nearly went bankrupt, but were rescued when the remaining 280,000 rifles were bought by the U.S. Army. They were used to train soldiers heading to the Western Front. How accurate is this round? Well, they used them for sniper rifles. They're, they can be really? darned accurate. It's a good round. It fires a, a 7.62 by 54R rimmed cartridge. It's about the same power as a 30-06. It's a, it's a stomper. I mean, it really is. Yeah, it's a bolt gun, so it's going to have some kick. It is, and it's got that hard butt plate. Yeah, um, metal butt plate. The initial ones, not this one, I'm sure, but uh, initial ones were the sights were graded in what were called Arsini, Arsini, which were a unit of measurement based on a pace. And uh, so it was nothing that was used in any other um, European weapon. A super rugged, reliable gun, simple to field strip. I mean, you can't, you can't get much easier. You know, you open the bolt, pull the trigger back, and out comes the bolt, oh, yeah. and you're ready to go. The interesting thing about the Mosin Nagant was that it was sighted in for use with the bayonet. The Russians were, were big believers in the bayonet. The sights were actually set for the gun to be fired with the bayonet on it. The Russian army was committed to the use of the bayonet. General Alexander Guvarov once said, the bullet is foolish, the bayonet wise. The poorly trained peasant armies were far more accurate in an aggressive bayonet charge than they were sighting down the barrel of their rifles. The bayonets were always fixed to these guns. The, the Russians didn't even have a bayonet scabbard. All right, well, Mike is down at the range. Why don't you take the Mosin? You guys go uh, have a little fun, will you? With a Mosin, that's not hard. I've shot Mosin at guns since I was, gosh, a kid, and probably in high school. Uh, I've owned a couple, and I have one right now I shoot. So. Uh... Tell me about the technical stuff okay. with the gun. Well, what, it's what a, kind of uh, 
Caliber is 7.62 by 54. Yeah. Integral uh, five shot box magazine. Okay. Um, it's um, rear sights adjustable for elevation. Battle sight probably around 200 meters. Okay. I didn't have huge expectations for the Mosin. I've shot one before. Safety. Okay. It's right there. It's not the most user friendly safety right. in the world. Right. They're decent guns, but I understood the gun's limitations before I shot it. I'll tell you one thing in both uh, World War I and World War II, the Russians had these juggernauts where they would have thousands and thousands of men. They didn't have enough rifles. Wow. So, what would happen is they had a whole rank of guys behind them with some ammunition. Really? And what they were supposed to do is pick up the rifles from the guys that were shot in the front and go load ahead and, and, fight. and load and fire. Wow. Yeah. That's hardcore. Um, if you ran, you, you know, you had an officer behind them with a with a uh, with a pistol shoot to, him to shoot them. Yeah. Uh, you know, Stalin said, you know, it, it takes a very brave man to be a coward in the Russian army. That's right. Because yeah. you're gonna get shot. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's shoot it and see how it shoots. You want to go first this time? Uh, yeah. Let me go ahead. I'll, okay. I, I don't mind. Um, Great. I'll spot for you. All right. Sounds good. Gary shot first, and Gary actually used a little bit different rest. He, he had two sand ba bags uh, piled on top of each other, and that worked for him. About 5 o'clock on the uh, 8 ring. That could be worse. Yeah, not bad. I was struggling with that sucker. I really was. That's a stiff bolt. It really, it, it, it's one of the stiffest I've ever felt, actually. The big thing is getting used to the trigger. The trigger is real long and kind of spongy. Right. Uh, it's a, it's an odd trigger. I figured we'd do minimum four to six inch groups, and that's what we got. All right. So the gun's doing exactly what it was designed to do. The bolt on the gun is very stiff. It takes you know, a lot of uh, aggressive muscle movement to get the bolt to work. But if you're not muscling the gun, it's, you're just not going to be able to clear the, the brass out of the chamber and get a new round in the gun. So we're getting up close and personal here. It's, you know, you got you to imagine the Huns are coming over the trench. Right, now. OK, Huns and, over and the trench. And you've got you to start manipulating this thing and shooting it as fast as you can. As fast as I can. As fast as you can. I'm going to make a, 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 a prediction here that uh, rapid fire may not be so rapid. It's not going to be real, no. The theory is, you know, if you're 10, 15 yards away and you've got four or five guys coming over the, you know, the trench or a hill at you, you know, how fast could you accurately put a shot in each of those persons? All right, let's see if we can rapid fire this gun. Here we go. Did I win the trench war? Uh, I'm not I'm not so sure. Not so sure? Yeah, I, I, I think I see a German butcher bayonet sticking out of your back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I kind of mentally put myself back in World War I or World War II, try to get a feeling of what the soldiers themselves had to deal with, how they had to manipulate this gun, how they had to work it, what it was capable of doing, what the other guys were shooting against them. Did they have a better gun? Did you have a better gun? The guy can cover 15 meters pretty darn fast. Wow. That is one heck of a bolt. Done. If an F was the lowest grade I could give a gun, I would consider giving them the Mosin an F, but I can't do that because I've got to take into consideration when it was produced and why it was so. produced. So, yeah, once again, I see the reason for the bayonet. Thing. Yeah, exactly. But I'll also tell you that I don't like the gun as much as the M1, the M14, so I'm probably going to give this gun a C minus. It's just not fast. Yeah, not fast yeah. enough. Yeah. All right, cool. Great, right, good shooting. The grades are in for all three historical military rifles. The M1 carbine, with its lightweight and superior firepower, got a B. Obviously, I'm taking into account the M1 was designed a long time ago for a specific purpose. The M14 battle rifle got an A. The accuracy of the gun, the fact that the sights were dead on with that 6 o'clock hold, very impressive. And the Russian Mosin-Nagant bolt-action rifle got a C. The bolt was very hard to manipulate, and the trigger it was a very long, squishy trigger that was hard to shoot accurately. Now it's time to hit the range and review the weapons before the shoot-off. So I decided to check in on Mike and Gary to see how things were going. We had all three weapons on location, M14, M1 carbine, and the Mosin. I wanted to feel these guys out a little bit. Knowing in the back of my mind we will be competing, 
in the near future. Hey, Colby. Okay, fellas. <laughs> moment of truth. The moment of truth. How are you? I'm Mike. Let's start with the M1. I want to send some rounds through it. Let's head over to the firing line. Okay. Going through my mind was, should we be coaching him and helping him out if we can help him out, or should we let him kind of fall on his sword if he's not doing too well because we've got to compete against him later on in the day? All right. So you guys going to give me any dope on this thing before I start? Or are you going to um, make me find out for myself? The gun's shooting low and to the right, so you're going to want to shoot high and to the left. A little high, a little left. Yeah. High, a little low. I hope we didn't get those guns mixed up. Well, it's possible. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> All right. I see nothing on the target. That's not good. It could be something on the board, but uh, it could very well be. All right, let me see it another one, guys. So far, that target is pristine. Really? Yeah. I'm thinking if he shoots like that in the competition, it's going to be much easier for Gary and I to win. Well, OK, that's in the board outside the black. Hmm. All right. Interesting. OK, that was about three inches outside the black on the board. And you have the front sight directly in the center of the aperture, Colby? I do have it in the center of the aperture. So yes. center of the aperture, lollipop it, maybe give it some space. Give some space no. between the black and the front sight. Hold on one second. Don't, don't shoot. I saw that he had the wrong aperture up on the M1. Six o'clock hold. Huh. He had the 300-yard aperture up, so I went over and flipped that and helped him out. So left. wait, this we got 150 and 300. Yeah. Was I just on the 300? Yeah. Hold, hold the left edge of the black now, Colby. Hold the left edge of the black. There you go. There you go. 10 ring at uh, 12 o'clock. I'm not going to help you anymore. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's well. time for us both to shut up. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Ten, excellent. 10 ring about uh, 1 o'clock and just a hair low. Glad you noticed that sight, Seek Lander. <laughs> I don't want to compete against someone and not have them at their best. So we ended up being nice and calling shots. I know where that one is. OK, I think you're cooking with that one. I don't know. I'm not a big fan of the M1. Gary, the biggest advantage to this thing is simply its compact size and, and weight. Light, light and handy. Well, Easy yeah. shooting, fun, like you said at the top. It's a, it's fun, a, fun, it's gun. a fun gun. To me, that gun is in no man's land. It's not a pistol, but it's not a heavy enough caliber to, to have the knockdown power of a, of a full infantry rifle. So I'm really just not a big fan of it. All right, guys, it's my turn with the M14. Yeah. Let's go. All right, I'll spot on this one, Gary. OK. I got to tell you, coming into this thing, I had never fired any of these guns. But the M14 is the one that I've always heard so many positive attributes about. And the M14 was one that my father's partial to. That's what he went through basic training in Vietnam with. He carried one in the war. So I came into this with a preconceived idea that I was really, really going to be partial to the M14. 2 o'clock in the uh, 8 ring. Yep. Uh, 1 o'clock in the 8 ring. Boy, this thing shoots good. It does. I like it. Uh, I think that was pretty much the same impact. I, I yeah, can't see I, a I, hole, I only see two holes in there, yeah. and I don't think you missed. One more. All right, that's 11 o'clock in the nine ring. So that's pretty good, man. Wow, nice. OK, I'm sold. It's not bad. I like it. Uh, certainly, he liked the M14. We could tell. You know, my guess would be that he would choose that. Well, I got to agree with you guys. The M14 is sweet, but we got one left. The good old Mosin Nagant. I'm going to give it a whirl. Let's go. Okay. I was fully prepared to dislike that weapon. Hadn't heard a lot of good things about it, and just the fact that it's, it's so vintage. It's so old. I've never even shot a gun that age. I'm going to dry fire it once. Are you kidding? One of the longest trigger pulls I've ever felt in my entire life. Well, the advantage of that is you never know when it's going to go off. Yeah, so you that, do. That, that basically, that helps accuracy. You know, and the old principle, you want to be surprised when it goes off. Exactly. It well, this one will.
Ten ring. Yeah, ten ring at two o'clock. Ten ring, two o'clock. Almost in the X-ray. See what we told you about should that? I, gun? Should I should I stop while I'm ahead? I, I think you'd probably be able to put it in another run right on top of that one. That's not bad. Well, six o'clock in the nine ring. Now get down, smoke a couple of rounds down there. It feels good. It's a good old bolt action rifle. That's what I grew up shooting. All right. Twelve, 12 o'clock in the eight. That's enough. Yeah, it's old. The trigger leaves a lot to be desired, but all in all, it just felt like a comfortable old pair of boots to me. I liked the Mosin. You're not having fun with that gun? No, no. You know what? I mean, think of all the history. I mean, that's, that's of all the three guns there, that's got the most history. I, I wasn't prepared to be impressed at all. Mm -hmm. And you're right, Mike. It is a bolt gun. Yep. It should be accurate regardless of its vintage. This right. one is. Right. Not a bad group at 100 yards. No. no. The recoil is not bad. No. I mean, you feel it. Mm -hmm. You can imagine what the guys, you know, mm -hmm. sure. back in the war that were using it all day, every day, mm -hmm. right. their shoulder might have been black and blue. Right. But sending a few rounds down range of practice, not that bad. No. It is what it is. The gun's doing what it's supposed to do. It's a 19th century weapon. It's a military gun. If that was a, a German soldier out there, he'd be toast. Well, I like it. Let's put it back up there. We have some uh, deciding to okay. do, gentlemen. Okay. Yep. Great. OK, we got to handicap these three guns. So between the three of us, let's figure out what is fair in terms of distance, target, position. Mike, suggestions? I'm going to say that we shoot uh, the M1 at 50 and the other two guns at 100 yards. Is that cool with you, Gary? Real happy with it. Yeah, not okay. a problem. Yeah. And uh, shooter choice on position? Any choice you want. Whatever you want. How many rounds, Gary? Five. So closest to the bull. Well, uh, no, no, we're going we're gonna to add it up. Yeah. Oh, so you, it's really you your group. Your game for all five so it's shots. your group. It's not one single shot. Group. I like it. Total yeah. score. Yeah, what about the hill climb? We're we gonna talk about the hill for him. The hill climb? Yeah, he yeah, yeah we did decide that you're gonna do the hill climb. <laughs> it, <laughs> probably that hill will work, right? Yeah, no. We've got Sorry. a clear snake. We right simply now. don't have time, so that's not gonna work. Hundred yards for the M14 and the Mosin, fifty yards for the M1. Right. I like it. So we're gonna flip a coin. Okay. Mike, you can choose blue or red. Red. I'm not exactly sure, but if we back up the take, to the nope. I think he waited for that thing to land on red before he called it. Red. Red it is. With a coin toss, normally I will close my eyes and I'll pick the opposite of whatever comes into my head. So blue came into my head, so I picked red. So I got to choose the gun. Sorry, guys. Well, that's, that's a real, a that's a real. That's a pretty tough choice. That's a yes, shocker. Sir. Yeah. Hmm. Mr. Seeklander gets the M14. He's going with the M14, which means that I am smiling again. <laughs> Gary James, I never thought I would say this, ever. Nor did I ever think I would choose the Mosin to Gaunt over anything, but that's what I'm going to go with. Mm. Uh, you're just trying to be nice to me, that's all. No, I'm not, yeah. and I know you like the M1. So I'm going to take this one before anybody changes their mind. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. Either one, I would have been happy with. I would have been fine with you. I would have been fine with either one. Yeah. Well, good. So yeah. we're all happy. Yeah, exactly. Military weapons introduced in war grow obsolete quickly. This week's weapons are all exceptions to this rule. The M1 carbine helped win World War II and went on to see action in Korea and Vietnam. The M14 battle rifle earned its reputation in Vietnam and then was snapped up by sniper units worldwide. The Mosin and Gant, first used by the Russians in the Boxer Rebellion of 1898, saw action for the next 80 years in five major wars. All right, Mike, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll do that. Now that all the weapons have been put through their paces, it's time for the shootout. We decided on the guns. We decided on the distances. We decided how many rounds we're going to send down range. So really, the only thing left is whether or not we're going to use a spotter. Whether you spot for yourself, whether the other two shooters spot for you, or whether you go in blind, we build the drama, and you don't know where your rounds hit until we bring the targets up. Gary pipes up and says, you know what? I think we ought to go blind. So you're saying no spotter? No spotter. And you don't spot for yourself? Nope. Five rounds, downrange, then we bring the target yep, up. Yep, absolutely. Seeklander doesn't like that idea. I'm living on the edge a little bit and actually thinking about a sight adjustment, which if I can't spot, I'm not going to 
have so any you, inclinations. You now want to adjust the sights on the M14. It we'll takes a lot of nerve. That takes... Wow. <laughs> That's a bold move. But you're saying you'll only do that if you can get a spot. That's correct. If I can't spot, then I'll probably hold off. Huh. So that means I got to decide what we're going to do here. It's up to you. I'm the underdog going in. I don't know as much as these guys, but I got a feeling Mike knows something I don't know. So me being the third vote and the deciding vote in this case, I like your idea, Gary. Going in blind, you don't know where your rounds are landing. We've all shot all three of these weapons. Right. I don't want to give Mike any advantage. So if he wants a spotter, I'm not going to give it to him. Let's do it. Yeah. No spotter. I like how my you, competitor makes the decision. You're going to have to use some <laughs> Kentucky windage on okay, that, Mike. I'm gonna, I'm gonna all right, you're up then, first. Right? OK, <laughs> let's do this. Let's go. I have competed nationally and internationally for a lot of years, and I would expect or think that the nerves would go away. But every single time I compete, I'm nervous. There's no doubt about it. My heart rate got a little higher, and uh, I felt it. Good luck, Mike. Thank you. That took a lot of time to get stable on the gun, which allowed me to perform as good as I could. One more shot, Mike. Good shooting. OK, so I propose we leave Mike's target down there okay. until you and I have gone. Gary. Oh, absolutely. Then we bring yeah. all three of them up at once. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Works for me. And I actually shouldn't have had eyes on target. But since I did, I'll go ahead and tell you, phenomenal shooting, Mike. Phenomenal group. Unbelievable. I had eyes on target while Mike was shooting his rounds. In hindsight, probably not a good idea, because I'm looking at the bullseye, and he's sending rounds through it. So right out of the gate, I feel the pressure. The only way I'm going to beat him is by hitting more bullseyes. And with a Mosin to Gant, that ain't going to be easy. OK. All right, Gary James. Good luck, Gary. Are we ready? Yes, sir. <sighs> when I watched Gary shoot, he shot great. His group was the best we had seen with that gun but he was a little off. Nice group. That's it. Nice. nice group. My only issue at this point is keeping my nerves calm enough, because I've already seen how well these two guys have done. You get nervous? Not yet. So yeah, we'll see. No, I'm not really nervous. Your heart rate will probably start going up once you get down there, I'm yeah. guessing. Trying to get in my head, Mike? No, not me. <laughs> it's not going to work. Well. No sense in postponing this any longer. <laughs> OK, well, the moment of go. truth. Five shots, huh, boys? Yep, five shots. Are you sure you don't want me to call a win for you or something like that, Cole? I'm good. So much of the fundamentals of shooting come down to muscle memory. And as soon as I got down with the Mosin, threw it up on the sandbags, all that my father and grandfather taught me when I was a kid took over. Hey, Mike, <laughs> that wind that wind died down a little bit out there. Yeah, it did. That's yeah, not too bad right now. It felt so comfortable and immediate, loading around in, breathing right, calming your breathing, steadying, getting a good sight picture, and squeezing the trigger. I think once we got in the competition, it helped that I didn't have a spot. Because no one was calling out my shots, I couldn't see where they were going. You don't get in your own head. You just go back to what you know. I just tried to put every one of them in the same spot. He shot the Mosin very well. I was very surprised. And at that point in time, I started to think, wow, if you know, my group and the position is not great, he could beat me with this Mosin to gun.
That's it. That's a wrap. Oh. Well. What do you think? Let's bring in the targets what and assess think? the damage, boys. <laughs> it's all over but the crying now. <laughs> Having seen what Mike did and then also seeing where Gary's shots landed, I was very, very worried. Not only did I think I was going to come in third, I thought I was <laughs> going to be in the cheap seats. I didn't think it was even going to be close. Heal it off, Mike. Let's see what we got. Ooh, not too shabby. Mm. Not too shabby, except, oh. All right. Yeah. First off, hey, Mike. Win. Yeah. Nice group. All right, let's Just score these out. Yeah. So all these are 10, right? Mm -hmm. 10, 20, 30, 40, and 9. That's right. 49. 49, 1x. Gary. Good group, you, but you made uh, a you made a home in the nine range. I made a right home here. in the nine range, yep. So what, nine times five is forty-five? Yep. Okay. Ten, 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 nine, nine. Am I right? That's right. That's 48. Right. Yep. 48. One point. Big Mike. Thanks. Great. Congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. Nice <laughs> shooting. You know, well, this is the, this is the best all three guns have shot in in yeah, the practice absolutely. and the match. Yeah. Wow, boy, that's a tight group. It's a nice, it's a nice group. I got no group. complaints about that. Here's the difference. Had we spotted each other, we could have told Gary where he was landed because your first shot absolutely. landed here. Hey, look, who made the decision not it was, to spot? It was my idea in the first place. Oh, you did? It, it, isn't that ironic? Okay. Gary's the one that suggests we don't use a spotter. And had yeah. he had one, yep. no doubt, Mike, he would have uh, he would have been in there on the tin ring. Hoist on my own petard. And I got to tell you, on mine, it is difficult without a spotter because you don't have any yeah, idea. No, that's right. And especially with a bolt gun, you're coming back every time, trying to get in the same position again. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, I got to tell you, I'm kind of proud of this target. Yeah, okay. yeah. Makes it well, that's good shooting. I it mean, is. you know, we've yeah. been shooting for two days. We had a lot more trigger time on the gun. Mm -hmm. You know, for you to come over and, and lay on the Mosin and do something like that, congratulations. That's great for, shooting. For host, that's the you host. give me some props, Mike? Yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, I give you some props for I that. Like it. That's darn good. Brother, I'll take it. I'll take it all day, Gary. I had a lot oh, of really fun. Thanks, thanks Mike. Thanks, thanks for coming on. Good shooting, man. I guess uh, I guess we got to buy the steaks now. Huh? I'm afraid so. All right, let's go do it. On this episode of Top Guns, survival of the fastest. Three automatic rifles, each one a major technological breakthrough in its day. From the revolutionary Browning automatic rifle, bringing walking death to trench warfare, to the ultra-modern Steyr Aug, a waking nightmare for terrorists confronted by a SWAT team, to the futuristic PS90, a fixed stock submachine gun trusted to protect the president. Throughout history, weapons, both primitive and modern, have been essential for survival. Used on the field of battle, for hunting, law enforcement, and personal protection. As technology advances, rifles, shotguns, and pistols are continually improved to be more precise and effective. On every episode of Top Guns, experts and marksmen will delve into the history, mechanics, and design of these weapons. After being field tested, they will be featured in a shoot-off to determine which weapons truly are the top guns. On this episode, we're looking at automatic rifles, and we've got the perfect weapons expert here to help. Greg Sawyer. Colby Donaldson. What's up, man? Good, Good to see, see you. you, dude. Greg Sawyer joined the Marines and worked in Force Recon. He later transferred to the Navy and joined the elite SEAL team. He served in Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. My grandfather gave me the 22 rifle that he grew up hunting and shooting with down in Southern Texas. I, you know, I'm training my kids with that same rifle today. My mother and father were on the ROTC rifle team together in college, so really? I actually didn't learn that until I got out of the Marine Corps. All right, tell me what guns we have today. Well, today we've got the BAR, the Browning Automatic Rifle. Yeah, baby. And let me show you what else. All right. The Steyr AUG and the FN P90. The day you show up, we're going 
full tilt boogie. These are all automatics, right? They're all automatics in their military form. Nice. All right, let's start with the Browning. The Browning automatic rifle was the US military's ace in the hole, helping to turn the tide in both world wars. The US Army entered World War I in 1917, slugging it out in the trenches with faulty belt-fed machine guns. John Browning came up with a new weapon design, the Browning Automatic Rifle. It had a 20-round box magazine and could be fired prone with the front bipod for stability or from the hip. The 30-06 caliber round gave a BAR gunner the edge in walking fire as they cleared trenches in the final months of World War I. Are these guys in that situation, shooting from the hip, shooting from the shoulder? If they're moving? If they're moving, they're doing both. As they get closer, a lot of the guys were shooting from the hip because you can see where the rounds are just tearing up everything. It's a 30 out 6 Springfield, yeah. so it's no joke, man. That thing is, is moving out, a lot of energy. For more accurate fire, shooting it from the shoulder when it ever possible, but sometimes from the hip as you get closer. After World War I, the BAR was packed away for storage. Prohibition changed all that. As the feds destroyed illicit liquor, infamous underworld figures like Al Capone, Pretty Boy Floyd, and Bonnie and Clyde took stolen BARs to a new battleground. The BAR could outgun anything the feds had to offer until law enforcement finally added the BAR to their arsenal. The BARs gave the edge to lawmen and stakeouts, and in Louisiana, on a lonely stretch of road, dozens of police brought down Bonnie and Clyde, firing their BARs from the bushes. What's the effective range? How accurate is this weapon out at distance? It's really accurate out to 1,500 yards. Really? Yeah, this rear leaf sight pops up, and you can slide the scale all the way up to 1,500 yards and then put some pretty pretty effective rounds on. No kidding. All right, Greg, let's bring in today's shooter. Every week, we invite a marksman to join our expert. And this week, to get a whole new take on these rifles, we brought in an experienced shooter who's fired plenty of automatic weapons, but never these particular firearms. Meet Jamie Franks. He's a small arms marksmanship instructor in the Navy, a Navy marksmanship expert in rifle and pistol and served two tours of duty in Afghanistan. Jamie Franks, come on in here. Hey, Jamie, how hey, are you? Hey, Greg. Hi, Jamie. See you again, Cole. How you doing? Two Good. Navy boys today. Jamie, have you squeezed the trigger on any of these? No, no, I have not. Really? Well, me neither. So we're in the same <laughs> boat, brother. All right, here's how it's going to work. I want you and Craig to take the Browning down to the range and put this thing through its paces. Critique these guns. I mean, go over them. See what you like and what you don't like. Have some fun. I'll join you guys later, all right? All right. See ya. Our marksman and expert will test all three weapons. Then I'll join them on the range for a friendly shoot-off. First up, the BAR. We've got the Browning Automatic Rifle, which is a gun that, uh, you know, I grew up watching all the World War II war movies and stuff. So I was familiar with the BAR through that respect, but I've never shot one, never held one. I've only seen them up close in museums and stuff. It uh, fires from the open bolt, right? It does, like some of the other heavier machine guns. Firing from the open bolt, the BAR is a little bit more difficult to master because there's not that instant firing when you break the trigger of the round. When you break the trigger with the BAR, it releases the bolt from the rear, and under spring tension, the bolt slams forward, setting off the round. So there's that slight delay. There's a selector lever that allows you to go from semi-automatic fire, which is one shot every time you pull the trigger, to fully automatic, which every time you pull the trigger, if you leave the trigger back, the weapon will continue to run. It's got a nice long barrel and a 30 out 6 round. It's got great distance, nice flat trajectory, so it's uh, highly desirable for, for long range shooting. What do you think? You want to get at it? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do it. With any weapon, the first thing you want to do if you're going to be using it with any degree of accuracy is to zero the thing. That's at 100 yards. All right, going hot. In order to shoot accurately, marksmen must zero the gun. 
aim at the bullseye and see where their shots actually hit. Then make an adjustment to be on target. All right, you're at about uh, 10 o'clock, about six inches outside the bull. The first group on the VAR was off to the left. So we brought that over two clicks, and that actually brought us twice as far as we needed to go. So we brought it back a bit. Nice, that's uh, 3 o'clock, about four inches outside the bullseye. I've gotten it about as close as I can for now. Uh, we'll get you on the gun and let you zero for yourself. Yeah. All I've ever done is seen them on TV, so now I get one thrown in my hand. When you bottom out the sights for a zero in the VAR, the first mark is 300, and we're shooting at a 100-yard target. So if you hold the sight post in the middle, you're going to be shooting up here somewhere. Ha! All right. Outside the black, one at three, one down at uh, five. OK. All right, uh, closer in, about uh, two inches right on windage. Good, nice. Uh, just outside the bull on the right. Based off of Craig's spots. And once I mastered not shooting on full auto and I was able to get that uh, one shot when I wanted it, I was able to walk my rounds right into the bullseye. All right, yeah, you're in there. High in the bull. Yeah. Well, I say from up here a little bit closer, we just go ahead and go full auto. Sounds about right, man. If you look into the history of the BAR, it was designed during World War I when everything was trench warfare. So we wanted to test out that walking fire theory that the gun was built around, that you would have a line of infantrymen with this BAR slung around their hip, just laying down a wall of fire as they're walking forward and advancing on the enemy trenches. For nearly three years, both sides of the war were locked into trench warfare. These trenches ran for miles as soldiers exchanged fire and peered over at the enemy. The BAR changed all that. The Allies now had mobile automatic firepower that could move forward and clear trenches. I'll send one full magazine and see if I can do a decent mag change with no sling and get another one in there. All right, you're off safe. Target. Relative to the mag changes I do in combat, with this thing, it felt like it took forever. I mean, taking my hand off and, and pushing that mag and pulling the other one out, and having to recharge the thing again, it felt like it took nine days. That's it. It's kind of fun, man. I say you give it a try. I'm not a big guy. You know, I'm not even as big as Craig. And that gun is a big steel beast. All right. Shoot ready? Target! Think a rocky back on it? <laughs> a little bit. There's no doubt about it, this gun's a reliable, stable weapon. I think anybody could get right behind it, load it, and shoot it. And that says a lot for the gun. But it was never meant for precision. It takes a lot of that weight, a lot of body mass behind that thing. Is It just wants to rock you back so quick. Iron, I mean, man. yeah. The BAR is such a big, hardy, hefty, proud piece of gear that I think we all just really appreciate that sex appeal about it and just want to shoot that thing. And it's got its own uh, style. Wait till Colby gets a hold of this thing. That'll be good. We've already looked at the Browning automatic rifle. Next up is the Steyr AUG. But first, a Top Gun's bullet point. Early rifles were built around a wooden stock, solid and durable. As new weapons were developed, designers began using innovative and lighter materials. With plastics engineered to be as strong as steel, more and more modern guns utilize polymers in their construction. Polymer frames provide textures and shapes that make guns easier to grip. Metal is vulnerable to dents and scratches. A polymer gun is not. However, the lighter weight increases the amount of recoil in polymer guns. Target! Results are in from the BAR test. Jamie found it to be reliable and stable, but 
my first choice would not be the BAR. It was never meant for precision. Next top gun to field test, the Steyr Aug. All right, Craig, where did this thing come from? Well, it's Austrian made. Uh, Steyr Mannlicher designed it in uh, 1977. And uh, it's very innovative. It looks futuristic. It looks it unlike any of its predecessors. The Steyr may look funny, but this weapon is all business. The Steyr AUG is a gas-operated semi-automatic rifle and was ergonomically engineered from the ground up to be compact and accurate. Firearms manufacturer Steyr Mannlicher is located in the city of Steyr, Austria, where firearms have been made since the 14th century. Released in 1977, the Steyr AUG was snapped up by law enforcement and SWAT teams all over the world because it enabled them to move easily through tight quarters or in and out of vehicles. Perfect for close quarters combat. What made it so popular was a successful bullpup design. Prior to this, I had never seen, you know, the magazine behind the trigger group and the grip. What was the logic behind it? Well, it's what we call a bullpup design. They took the bolt system and put it behind the trigger instead of front of it. So this thing's still sporting 18, 20-inch barrel, but package-wise, much shorter than what a, a typical AR would be. Yeah. Right? The only downside to a bullpup design I find is that for an operator, using this thing, you know, with full tactical gear, instead of changing your mags up in front that's so instinctive and intuitive, you've got to reach up in, in between underneath sure. with all your tactical gear and do your mag change, where it's a little bit congested as far as space. Did all of these come with a polymer mag even back then? Or is this they did. Um, and I suspect it was just because the materials that they could make something that's this tough yeah. and reliable and have it be translucent so that you can see how many rounds are in there. Well, Jamie's waiting down at the range. You guys have fun. I'll catch up with you in a little bit. Very good. I'm looking forward to this one the most, I think, out of all three. I want to think this one would be my most accurate. Well, we'll have a quick look at it here. Yeah. One of the things that I really like about the AUG is that it comes with multiple barrel options. In this case, you just press down on the button here and rotate the barrel to the left, and it comes right out. <laughs> You take your other barrel. This one's a carbine barrel. You lock it in, and you're ready to go with this one. To be able to change the barrel that fast and not impact the reliability of the weapon at all is, is awesome. On an AR and M4, you literally have to take the weapon to an armorer, and it's going to take a few hours to get the barrel changed out properly. So that's I think that's a really cool feature of this tire hog. All right, uh, what do you say? Let's go shoot this thing. All right, I'm on. Looking down the sights, I didn't really care for the sights that much. The reticle is just a simple donut. There's not a dot in the middle of it, and that's a lot of room for error inside that reticle. I'm gonna send it. Bottom of the X-ring. Seven o'clock, uh, two minutes. Eight o'clock, one minute. Eight o'clock, three minutes. When I first picked up the AUG, it feels really good in your hand. It's all the weights kind of towards the back, so it has a nice balanced feel. String and going low and left. It's a nice group, buddy. Once Craig and I had gotten a zero on it, we decided to do a, a facing movement, a 180, shoot, combat reload, and shoot. If I got this weapon tomorrow, I would spend a lot of time doing the magazine changes and just getting to where the magazine changes are lightning fast. You just want to be as efficient with that piece of gear as possible because, let's face it, uh, your life could depend on it. Break out the timer. All right, shooter ready. Shooter, stand by. Ah. So here's what you did. Your mag change was uh, 965. Then you ran all the rest of your rounds out. Your 10th round was at 1504. Let's get you on it. All right, see, it. see what see what happens. Shooter ready? Stand by. Nice. 
Nice group, nice group. Overall is a 12.64, 5.43 mag change. Nice. Not bad. Your windage is good. It's yep. just uh, elevation uh, group down at six. That's working that trigger and probably coming down on it every time. Okay. Overall, I was really impressed with this gun. I liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to. The ergonomics are really good. It's balanced really well. Um, the recoil is maybe a touch better than what it is on an M4 and AR, but that reticle that's not very precise takes away from what the weapon would otherwise be capable of. We go ahead and move on to the next weapon. I think uh, Colby's gonna like this a little more than he thinks he will. Yeah, I'll stand here and shoot this one all day, but if you wanna move on, let's go. We got more territory to cover, so let's do it. All right. We're testing three automatic rifles, the Browning Automatic, the Steyr AUG, and from Fabrique Nacional, the PS90. But first, a Top Gun's bullet point. Muzzle velocity is the speed of a bullet at the moment it leaves the barrel of the gun. It can vary from 400 feet per second with pistols and up to 4,000 feet per second in rifles. As a projectile speeds towards a target, bullet speed drops off gradually because of air resistance. The speed of the bullet is determined by the amount of gunpowder used in the cartridge. The more gunpowder, the higher velocity. Back on the range, Navy SEAL Craig Sawyer and Navy weapons instructor Jamie Franks continue to test the automatic rifles leading up to a final shoot-off. Jamie's evaluation on the Steyr AUG, a full-size rifle with a full pup design. I think this weapon is capable of being a very accurate, very precise weapon. And up next, the incredibly futuristic PS90, a civilian version of a military submachine gun on steroids. Craig, if the AUG was cutting edge in its design back in 77, this thing takes it to a whole new level. What is it? That's the FN P90, or in this configuration with a little longer barrel, the PS90. This unusual weapon design is law enforcement's answer to the increasing threat of terrorism. The FN P90 is a very compact, highly effective personal defense weapon designed to surprise and confront any threat with devastating speed. In 1986, with terrorists beginning to wear body armor, NATO requested that a new weapon be developed to give its troops enhanced penetration capabilities. This lightweight submachine gun was released in 1990 to military and law enforcement for use in tight spaces such as inside armored vehicles. Smooth, rounded contours of the P90 prevent it from snagging a shooter's clothing when this small but feisty firearm lets loose a stream of deadly fire. Obviously, it's super lightweight, other than the barrel, there's really not a lot of metal on this thing. That's pretty much it, you know? Uh, a lot of it is, is polymer. All right, well, listen, Craig. Jamie's waiting down at the range for you. Why don't you head down? And remember, in the not-too-distant future, the three of us are going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with all three of these guns. So be thinking about which one you might choose if you win the coin toss. Right I kind of have an idea of which one I'm gunning for. All right, man, I'll see you in a bit. Very cool. See you there. I heard that the Secret Service was phasing out their MP5s and picking up the P90. Look what I got for us. So then that made me kind of take a second look at it, thinking maybe there is something to the gun. U.S. Secret Service agents protect the president and other top leaders. They utilize the latest weapon technology to confront any threat. In the 50s and 60s, they carried revolvers. In the 80s and 90s, they loaded hollow point rounds. By 2000, they began using guns made of polymer and other synthetics. 2011, they moved to close combat style weapons, including the FN P90. The magazines for this weapon are fed from the top. So even though it's a bull, it's a bull pup design, mm -hmm. you don't have the magazine back here, you've got it on top. Uh, it's got a, another thing that I think is a little bit funky. It's uh, got a little bit strange grip with your trigger finger in here and your forward hand on this grip. This is actually a, a a safety mechanism to keep you from reaching forward. Right. right now, having shot the BAR and the Steyr AUG, if we were going into a shoot off, no question about it, my choice would be the Steyr AUG. And I uh, haven't shot the PS90 yet. Well, let's load the thing up, man, and see how she shoots. And I can't see that little bitty bullet standing up to the same consistency as that 5.56 five, five, round. 
Gun manufacturer Fabrique Nationale designed a special bullet to be fired by the P90. It is nearly half the size of the BAR bullet and packs a special punch. After striking the target, the projectile turns 180 degrees, leaving a ragged channel of damage. Then it stops within eight inches of the point of penetration, reducing collateral damage and limiting ricochet in urban close quarter combat situations. Start on the uh, the larger target just to make sure this thing's not too far off. All right. No, it's not too far off. You see it? No. -uh. You're in the bullseye. Yeah, I see the hole it's making there now. Yep. PS90. It's so unlike any other weapon that I've fired. I actually started off at one pace and realized with every break of the trigger that it wasn't recoiling as far as I thought it was going to. And I just began increasing the pace and shooting quicker and quicker and quicker and not suffer loss on your accuracy. Go ahead and take it, man. She's still hot. All right. When I first held it in my hand, I mean, it's obvious that they built it with ergonomics in mind because everything feels real comfortable in your hand. The weight's almost not even there. And you got that little barrel sticking out the front, all the weights in the rear. I'm gonna shoot on the, uh, the next target. Okay. It's very stable and very ergonomic, and and it just feels like you know it's it's made just for you. The thing was a tack driver. You could drive nails with it. You could write your name out on that target. It's got a ringing sound to it yeah, when it, it does. fires, doesn't it? Most of my shots are here in the 10 ring, and I had a few flyers just from trying to shoot it fast. And your accuracy is always going to suffer a little bit when you're trying to go faster, but that's still pretty good. Your group is ridiculous. I don't think I could do that with a 9 millimeter that fast, I don't think, because it shoot it, and it's, right, it's still right there, you know? All right, man. Let's figure out what's next. I say push it back another 20 yards and see how it shoots from there. Yeah. All right. Well, we decided next to add 20 yards of distance and see how this this wee little round, the 5.7, does a little bit greater range. You're on, uh, you're gonna shoot target number four? I'll shoot number four, yeah. Okay. The PS90 feels a little bit strange to me, uh, but overall, I man, it's a really fun weapon to shoot. It just, it's a race gun if there ever was one. Have a look at those yep. things. Now, I don't even know what to make of that. 20 yards, and we've got another, what? Six inches, at least. Yeah. There was a great difference in elevation from 15 or 16 yards uh, to 36 yards. Man, with that sight height. Yeah, because it's like that. It must have just been enough of an angle to bring those rounds this far at that distance, an additional 20 yards. It's just extreme, though. I wouldn't have expected no. that at all. Overall, it's the PS90, I like it. Shooting this gun, it's unbelievably stable and accurate. And the PS90, you can put very fast shots on target, but not as far away. So if we were having to shoot further away, you're going to have to kind of walk it in with that PS90. Still, all in all, fun weapon. Yeah, it's still, I mean, it shoots true. It's just uh, that round's just light. But what do you think we ought to do with it to challenge it uh, against the other weapons? This weapon, the only big up it's got on the, uh, on the other two we shot is its ability to shoot fast and hold it exactly where you want it. These all are yeah. very unique. And uh, I think we can put our heads together and come up with something fun. All right, man. Good job. Hey, you too. It's been a pleasure. So far on this episode of Top Guns, Three automatic rifles have been tested. The Browning Automatic, dispensing walking fire as the enemy flees. The Steyr Aug, a bullpup with an attitude. And finally, the PS90, 6.5 pounds of accurate bullet delivery from a 50 round magazine. Marksman Jamie Frank summed up his experience with the PS90. 
its ability to shoot fast and hold it exactly where you want. Now it's time to hit the range and review the weapons before the shoot off. All right, fellas. Hey, Colby, how yeah. are you? Well, I'm good. I'm good. Coming into today, I've heard, and I guess I'm a little familiar with two out of the three weapons, the Steyr and the BAR. I've never fired any of these weapons, uh, but certainly excited. And obviously, just the history behind the Browning is what I was looking forward to the most. It's time for me to put it in my hands. I want my turn with it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do that. Colby comes out, puts his hands on the BAR. Uh, you know, he's from Texas. He's no stranger to guns. And we just wanted to take him through a couple of the helpful yeah. hints that we had discovered from shooting the gun ourselves. These sights, uh -huh. that even when you bottom them out, they're set for 300, so you're going to have to hold a little bit low. OK, I'll uh, engage the uh, target on the left, guys. Yep, I'm on. Send it. <laughs> 6 o'clock, nice two-round group. Yep. About uh, two inches low. Copy. You're in the thin ring at about 1 o'clock. OK, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> the Browning felt just the way I thought it would. It's big, it's bulky, but it's light enough. Even though it is a big, heavy gun, it's light enough that you can get it into position easily, and the recoil is minimal. Nice, your first shot was in the tin ring. Boy, I like this. I really enjoyed the Browning right out of the gate. I like that gun. And that's 20. That 20 rounds goes in a hurry. Yeah, it doesn't take long with a 20 round mag. So now, did you guys, you said you did some of this offhand? Yeah. yeah. I want to hold this thing, you know? <laughs> right, enough of that. That's too easy. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's go, up, yeah. yeah. To grab an original period correct weapon and just imagine that this was the same gun that the boys were using, the Doughboys were using in World <laughs> War I. It's a, it's a really neat historic feeling uh, to grab a piece of history like that. That's some good stuff, though, isn't it? That is, uh, that's the way that gun is fun right there. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is badass. All right, next up, the Steyr. Steyr Aug's a pretty simple gun to run. He needed almost no instruction there. All right, I'm on when you're ready. Six o'clock at the bottom of the black. There you go, right on the tin ring. Boy, that, that is a stout trigger on this thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a little stiff and creepy. Yeah, it is. Makes you think the gun's on safe. Jamie and Craig pointed out that it's got a bad trigger on it, but once you overcome that and you're used to that trigger pull, uh, then you can get some pretty accurate shots downrange with it. Yep, X-ring again. OK. It's my first time with the gun. I like it. I like it a lot. All right, let's grab the last one. And finally, the PS90. The PS90 I wasn't immediately sold just on the aesthetics. I'm a traditionalist, and I like traditional looking firearms. Call me old school. I don't know. I see this other set of targets out here. I got a feeling you guys have something up to your sleeve for the competition we're about to have. Of course. After you start uh, picking up the speed on this one, you'll see why, too. It just wants to go, man. That's right in the X, isn't it? Yep. yep. Chewing a hole just like in the carnival. <laughs> OK, so I'm starting to like this thing yeah, a little more. See what I mean? I mean, <laughs> super light, no recoil. The PS90 is like truly like a pellet gun or a BB gun in terms of recoil. So for that reason, it's great. Definitely Did you guys take it at the other targets? Yeah, well, uh, we started off at this one. This is 50 feet or 16 yards. Yeah. And then uh, we decided, OK, that's uh, pretty easy at this distance, so let's punch it out a little bit. Yeah. So then we started uh, with the other ones. You're off the paper at about 12 o'clock. Now, that's what we found, too. At the 50 feet, the trajectory of the round, Colby, is intersecting with your line of sight. But at 35, that trajectory is continuing on up. You're right. And so it's actually hitting above uh, the point of aim, 
by, you know, six, seven inches. Because of this distance between your, your sight and your muzzle. Yeah. Yes. That gun is designed for, for CQB, close quarters. And so anything beyond that, and you, you got into a real judgment call with your, your sighting system because it just didn't, it didn't work. I got to tell you, it shoots better than it looks. I, I like it. I, I'm not a fan of the round, uh, but I'm a fan of the gun. All right. So now it's time for the friendly competition. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to flip a coin. We're each going to get one of these weapons, OK? So we need to handicap the challenge or the competition before we know what weapons we have. So have you had any ideas or thought any about how we want to set this up? So we try to figure out what's an appropriate handicap to set these things up to have some sort of runoff between the three weapons. Well, uh, after some consideration, we, we both came up with uh, just handicapping the distance for each weapon. And so we, uh, we came up with the 36 yards uh, for the PS90, okay. 75 yards for the BAR, okay. and 100 yards for the Steyr. At those distances, no matter which gun you draw, you're going to have to do a little work to get your rounds on target. I agree. I like it. All we got to do now is flip a coin. Automatic weapons are built to shoot fast, and these three rifles are all qualified in this category. The Browning Automatic can shoot at a rate of 600 rounds per minute. The Steyr AUG can shoot at a rate of 700 rounds per minute. The ES90 can deliver 900 rounds per minute. Now that all the weapons have been put through their paces, it's time to select a rifle and load up for the shootout. Here's how it works, gentlemen. We have three coins, blue on one side, red on the other. All right? Odd man out gets to choose his weapon first. Make sense? Two of us land on blue. The guy who lands on red gets to choose first. Then the remaining two guys will flip. Call right. it. All right. Sounds fair. All at the same time. One, two, three. Blue. Red. Blue. blue. Oh, Jamie <laughs> gets to choose first. I think I have an idea of what Step he's going to go for, Craig. I know. Hi. He's... I'm going to take the Styrog. Yeah, no shocker there. <laughs> we knew he was going to go for the AUG. OK, so now you call it in the air, Craig. Blue. It's red, which means you're going to get the PS90 because I'm <laughs> taking the BAR, baby. <laughs> All right, fellas, let's do this. Woo given the handicap, which meant we leave Craig with the PS90. And oh, by the way, Craig's probably the best shot easily out of the three of us. So you almost have to handicap your shooters by giving them the weapon that's not as accurate. I think if I had won that very first coin toss, I probably would have reached for that Steyr, just because it's a pretty consistent and stable feeling rifle and, uh, and pretty simple to shoot. I'm not sure how Craig felt about being stuck with the PS90. But uh, I would take that Styrog all day long, and, and you know, no matter what happens, I don't think I'm going to regret my choice. All right, let's give it a whirl. So even though we weren't using a spotter during the challenge, I really felt confident. So based on where the BAR was hitting for me in practice, I was holding in what I thought was the same spot. Because no one was calling out my shots, I couldn't see that far. I couldn't see where they were going. Oof. Come on, baby. Seemed like he was doing pretty good, but I, I wasn't able to observe his impacts on the target. So I reached for the binoculars, picked up the binoculars. He got every bit as tight of a group out of that BAR. Only thing was his real nice tight group was low and left and a little bit off the, the actual paper target. Here we go. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> He didn't get a single round on the paper. I was feeling pretty good going into the shoot off. Let's see what you got, Franks. I know for a fact I'm at least going to get my shots on the paper. So it took a little bit of pressure off me. Feeling good? Feeling confident? Yeah. I don't know, Jamie. You're going to have to do better than that, son. <laughs> 
the optic on the Styrog is a one and a half power, which means it's uh, it's just a teeny tiny bit of magnification over what you see with your naked eye. So once I got about four or five rounds down range and I was able, starting to establish a group, I was able to see that through the optic. So I knew about where I was hitting on the target. Nice little group there, Jamie. Ooh, maybe I shouldn't have looked at that. You know, I didn't feel too much pressure. I just knew that I was going to get up there and, and lay down as accurate a group as I could. Good shooting. And see how it came out. Good luck, Mr. Sawyer. Not that you'll need it. And for a sniper, nothing but the best. Uh, nice puff of left or right, right wind here. Yeah, of course. We're in the wind for you. That was the other handicap I didn't mention. <laughs> Right as I pulled out the PS90 to shoot that thing, the wind started picking up, and we had uh, good, healthy left to right, the full value gust going on. I was like, oh, great. Now that I'm going to shoot this, this wee little round and, and, and this wind, I'm going to be trying to fly that thing into the bullseye. Let's see how this is going to go. We may be in big trouble on this one. He found his hold. As a sniper, you have to read that wind constantly because it's a very dynamic medium to shoot through. And if you're not watching it literally by the second and updating it constantly, and if you don't, uh, you're just not going to sink your, your rounds where you want to at long range. That's it, right, Tim? Yep, that's Tim. From my perspective, you know, looking at my target from 100 yards away, it looked like Craig and I were going to be pretty close. Targets are scored with bullet strikes earning 10 points for the center ring, 9 points for the second ring, 8 points for the third ring, and 7 points for the fourth ring. All right, guys, the moment of truth. Ready to see the damage? Let's do it. Yeah, let's, let's see, see it. what we did. Well, now, hold on. That can't possibly be my target. First off, I thought the guys were playing a joke on me. I look at my target, and there, there, are not, there aren't any bullet holes in my entire target. And I really thought somebody was jacking with me. Yeah, your group actually looked about like mine, but it was uh, off on the wood. We've actually got it right here. So look, if you look at, at the pattern, that's actually very good shooting, Colby. So that's embarrassing. What that is. Yeah, it shouldn't be embarrassing <laughs> if you if you had a little more time to calibrate the sights uh, for wow. you, the shooter. Hmm. You'd have been right in there. <laughs> you know, Greg and Jamie were trying to make me feel better by telling me I had a tight group. Tight group or not, the reality is they weren't on target. They weren't even close to the target, and that's a bummer. It was certainly off the mark. Okay, moving on to Jamie. Again, nice group. Yeah, not yep. bad. One, two, three. That's two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And one in the bull. It was good shooting, just a little elevation. Wow. You know, he's, he's having a hold and trying to figure out uh, what it looks like down there at 100 yards. Right on. OK, Craig. Now, with this one, with the P90, I was holding down about this far. And as the wind dropped off, I was holding here. And the end result was uh, a little bit high. And the windage was still a little bit off. But all in all, I was able to sink a so few So what do we got? Looks like there's. Six of them there in the 10 group? Yep. Yep. And then the seven, eight, nine, Four 10. Four in the nine. Yeah, wow. Well, uh, Craig, you won that round, buddy. Yeah, well, I think we all won, man. Yeah, well. Who didn't have fun, right? Yeah. It's no surprise that Craig won. I mean, that uh, PS90 is a tack driver. It's very repeatable. It's very consistent. Craig is a, a super locked on. You know, he's a Navy SEAL sniper. And uh, you know, if I have to be beat, no sweat off my back being beat by a guy like Craig. It was a joy working with Jamie so much. His fundamentals of, of marksmanship are, are rock solid, and uh, he's gotten some really good training in it. And it comes out watching him work with different weapons like this on a set, and it was a, it was a really cool experience working with him. Jamie had a tight group, but it wasn't as close to the bullseye as, as Craig's. And Craig, man, I'm telling you, dude, that guy sent three rounds downrange to get it doped in, figure out where his, his rounds were going, and then after that, it was all over. I mean, just pay the man his money. You're not going to beat him. I don't care what gun. You could put a tomahawk in his hand, and we couldn't beat him. You were the victor today. Nice job. Jamie, Thank thanks for coming on, man. A lot thanks, of fun. I really you. enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Thanks.
Thank you. On this episode of Top Guns, we look at three super shotguns from the Benelli M4, eight and a half pounds of terror and destruction, opening doors for Marines on the battlefield to a bird hunter's dream, the Benelli Vinci, a lightweight shotgun packed with 21st century technology to the Pump Action Nova, a new generation of pump gun and one of the most versatile shotguns on the market. Throughout history, weapons, both primitive and modern, have been essential for survival. Used on the field of battle, for hunting, law enforcement, and personal protection. As technology advances, rifles, shotguns, and pistols are continually improved to be more precise and effective. On every episode of Top Guns, experts and marksmen will delve into the history, mechanics, and design of these weapons. After some trigger time on the firing line, they will be featured in a shoot-off to determine which weapons truly are the Top Guns. Today, we're looking at shotguns, and we've got the perfect expert here to help. Chris Reed. Colby. What's up, man? Good to see you, man. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good. Chris Reed began shooting as a boy and later excelled with weapons in the Marines. As an accomplished marksman, he's won several national awards. In 2010, he was the winner on History's Top Shot Season 2. Now I'm excited. Already, I recognize one of these guns. This is one that I have in my gun cabinet. Tell me what you brought for us today. Today, we've got the Benelli M4, mm -hmm. we've got the Benelli Vinci, and we've got the Benelli Nova. Right on. We've got two semi-automatics and a pump shotgun to play with and looking forward to it. Bird gun, tactical gun, and somewhat of a hybrid, I guess. Yeah, just, Nova. just kind of all around. All right, let's start with the M4, Chris. So this is the one that the Marine Corps adopted. Correct. All right. When U.S. Marines need to search and destroy a target at close quarters, they reach for the Benelli M4, a semi-automatic gas-operated shotgun. It is one of the most advanced tactical shotguns ever produced. Italian engineers built upon 200 years of shotgun development to perfect this military weapon. Built for battlefield conditions, the M4 uses spent gases to put a new round in the chamber. The M4 has a metal accessory frame called a Picatinny rail for adding a scope or other attachments. For stability, it has a pistol grip stock. The military uses a shorter barrel version, which makes it easier to maneuver and transport in close combat situations. It's probably one of the most sought after tactical shotgun, semi-automatic version in the world today. It's, it's just one bad shotgun. Heavy hitting, reliable. This is a good gun. I'm telling you, I love it. I love this gun. I love the way it shoots. Obviously, this is a tactical shotgun. So it this is. isn't something you're going to take out in the field and go dove hunting with. It'd be a little heavy to tote around. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, it's basically you know used as a riot shotgun, crowd control, military application. Although you can get a civilian version, a lot of guys are going to it on the the three gun championships. You know, the three gun shooting style. Chris, let's bring in today's shooter. Every week, we invite a marksman to the range to test the weapons and give us a practical perspective on these firearms. Today's marksman shoots American Skeet, Olympic Skeet, Five Stand, and Sporting Clays. And I think you might recognize this guy, Jay Lim. Chris Reed. What's happening, Jay? Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> you guys were team yeah, captains on yeah. Top Shot. Heck yeah. Well, Jay, we've got shotguns, my man. You recognize any of these? Yeah, one of my buddies has a Nova over there. The pump? Yep. We got the Vinci, and we got the M4. And you guys are going to have fun with all of them. First thing I want you guys to do is take the M4 down to the range. Now, Jay, use them, abuse them, run them through their paces. At the end of this, I want you to tell me what you like and what you don't like, OK? Take off with the M4. I'll check in with you in a little bit. Let's go right, rock and roll, go. buddy. Our marksman and expert will test all three weapons. Then I'll join them on the range for a friendly shoot-off. 
All right, Jay. Today we're gonna look at the M4. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. I'm not familiar tell. with this. What kind of sights are we uh, All right. working with? Here? That's ghost ring sight set up. A little bit different than the traditional dovetail sights. Basically, it's just got one big ring on the rear. You send the front sight post in the ring, and whatever's in front of it is in trouble. Shotguns have been carried into war for centuries, beginning with the blunderbuss, used widely in Europe during the 17th century, a black powder weapon that could be loaded with several lead balls per shot. In the Civil War, cavalry units carried shotguns and inflicted great damage at close range. They were also part of the defense of the Alamo in Texas. Shotguns with bayonets were used during World War I, sometimes called trench guns. In World War II, Marines of the Pacific Theater found them effective for clearing the jungle. In modern wars, the military uses shotguns as breaching tools and in close quarters combat. Okay, this thing is made for destruction. It's made to be fast. and. Uh, but we're gonna see how accurate this thing can shoot, we, though, right? We're gonna try it out, man. Be my guest. It was a nice, hefty gun. Um, I liked the feel of it when I first picked it up. In order to shoot accurately, marksmen must zero the gun, aim at the bullseye, and see where their shots actually hit, then make an adjustment to be on target. I'd All say right, start at 25 and just see what it does. Let's sight this in first at 25. Good shot. It was more accurate than I expected. Good shot. It was shooting a little bit low left for me, but that, that would be a simple adjustment. Both Chris and Jay took aim at targets at distances of 25 and 50 yards. Center. A little low. Tad low, good shot. There you go. Pretty good, man. I mean, with a short barrel slug gun, I'd hate to be standing down range in front of it. <laughs> yeah, the the group is low left. Yeah. For what it is, shooting man-sized targets 50 yards or less is perfectly acceptable, completely acceptable with this type of weapon. Right. A little better than I thought it would be. I think for all practical purposes, the Benelli is, is still designed to be a short range weapon. Next, Chris and Jay decided to take aim at a more practical target to test the damage the M4 can inflict at close range. What this thing is built for is just is speed and devastation. I mean, it's clearing rooms, knocking down walls, shooting through walls. We got a stack of cinder blocks out there. Just want to shoot one of these rifled slugs. Now, we're shooting a two and three quarter inch shell. This thing will shoot three inch magnums. So this is like the little baby slug. Probably not going to get a lot of penetration. I wouldn't expect it to go through. One, one and maybe crack, yeah, one, one cinder block and probably crack the second one. Right. So I'll take a shot at it and just see what we get. You don't get on the spot and scope? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I probably need to shoot it out. All right, you ready? Yeah. One shot. All right, I think that's exactly the result we anticipated. The first shot Chris took was just, you know, to get a general idea of what, what it would do to a cinder block. Looks That's like a pretty good, in. yep, pretty good hit on this side. And, uh, but again, did it even? There's your slug. There it is. Yeah. The slug did exactly what it was supposed to do. You know, when it hits the solid surface and expands like that, that's where you get the knockdown power from. It's not designed to penetrate. Did it even make a scratch on the inside? Absolutely not. It stopped right in the middle of it. So we thought, you know, if we took a couple of shots at it, we could probably blow away that cinder block. I mean, you want kinetic energy. You want knockdown power. You want to blow your assailant into the next room, if possible. The devastating power of a slug cartridge or slug round is, is exactly that. I mean, it's devastating. This thing hits a brick wall, and it just blows chunks out. Golly. We wanted to test the penetrating power in another capacity, so we set up a bunch of jugs of water. Shoot the slug dead center, and let's just see how many jugs we can go through just to see what kind of devastating power a 12-gauge slug is actually capable of. So how far do you think it's going to go through? <laughs> if I had to guess, I would say the slug will actually probably penetrate three jugs. The energy will probably knock off two or three more. The unbelievable marksman that he is, you know, offhand, dead freaking center.
All right, let's see what we did. So we got one, two, three jugs. I was half right. I got the three jugs, but it didn't knock any more off. Right. So the last bottle had a very clean hole right in the middle, and I thought, there's no exit hole. Hey, you I got think it. We found it. You got it. Look at that. <laughs> it's just a real smooth finish, and it looked like a big washer. He could probably make a necklace out of it and put it on eBay and, and probably retire off of it. <laughs> All right, Jay, tell me what you think about the M4. The M4 was meant to be a tactical gun for stopping power and destruction, not necessarily for accuracy. And it was surprisingly more accurate than I expected. This gun did exactly what it was supposed to do. It functioned really well. We didn't get a single jam out of this gun. This thing was designed for close quarters combat. Accuracy was an afterthought. It exactly. just so happens to be pretty accurate. Exactly. And uh, you know, the ghost ring points to that. You know, the trigger points to that. Yep. All right, Jay, we play with the M4 a little bit. Let's go check in with Kobe and see what else he got. For All right. Him. Come on, I know a shortcut. We're looking at three Benelli shotguns, the M4, the Vinci, and the Nova. But before we get back to the range, some essential bullet points. The term sawed off shotgun refers to any shotgun whose barrel has been shortened to make it easier to maneuver or conceal. Outlaws use them to stir up trouble in the Old West. The shorter length delivers a slower muzzle velocity and a wider spread pattern for the ammo. These shorter shotguns are illegal for civilians to own in many countries. A barrel length of less than 18 inches is against the law in the United States. Although made popular by criminals, law enforcement and the military also use sawed-off shotguns. Results are in from the range tests on the M4 shotguns. This gun did exactly what it was supposed to do. We didn't get a single jam out of this gun. Next up, the Benelli Vinci shotgun. Birds flee at just the mention of the name. All right, Chris, let's move on to what I would call a bird gun, the Vinci. A hunter can only perform as well as the weapons he's using, and the Benelli Vinci is a bird hunter's best friend. The semi-automatic shotgun is made out of polymer, wrapped around a steel frame, making it incredibly lightweight. The geometric pattern on the gun stock is actually the result of special materials that minimize recoil considerably when the gun is fired. Benelli engineers kept all the gun's energy from loading to firing, moving along a single central axis of the barrel. This makes it easy to acquire a target and fire precisely without the front of the barrel being jerked upwards with every shot. The Vinci is, uh probably one of the finest semi-automatic shotguns out there today. It has a couple standout features on it. You have the chevrons added into the stock, basically to reduce the recoil, mm -hmm. and it actually helps, you know, a good bit. It does seem to make a difference on recoil. Yep. So the recoil goes straight to the rear. You're not wasting any gas, and you're getting the full load every time you pull the trigger. Right. Well, the first thing you notice when you pick this thing up, especially after we've been handling the M4, is just the weight, or lack thereof. Yep. I mean, this thing is super light. But also notice that, um, you know, it looks like there's more plastic on this gun, or uh, I don't know what material that is. Polymer. I'm, polymer. Okay, there you go. Uh, so obviously that that attributes to just the lightweight, the lightweight nature of this gun, huh? Well, you know, if you if you're toting it in the field all day, or you're wagging it in and out of a duck blind and, and standing out there, weight is an issue, you know. Well, let's bring Jay back in so I can send you guys down with the Vinci. Here's what's gonna happen, Jay. First of all, it's time to take the bird gun down. But after you guys have had some time with all three of them, at the end of this, we're all gonna get to pick a weapon, and then you're gonna get to pick your shot. So start thinking about what you can accomplish with each one of these guns, because we're gonna have to flip a coin. You're not gonna know what gun you're gonna get unless you win the flip, all right? Good then. All right, have, have fun, fun with the Vinci. Yep. I was excited to hear that, you know, the Vinci was one of the guns that we were gonna shoot. Right, you know, I was really expecting a lot from it. All right, first thing I'm interested in is just how dead gun fast is it? You want to just see if we can let it rip? Sure. Most people shooting shotguns really aren't concerned with the recoil. 
pretty quick. Not bad. Doing a little jumping around. I mean, I'm a big boy. I like to shoot hard shooting guns and, and kind of like the horsepower, if you will. Jump on it, man. See what you can get out of it. Benelli engineers called this semi-automatic shotgun the Vinci because, much like Leonardo da Vinci's inventions, this gun was built with innovative new ideas. Take the barrel, for instance. They wanted it to be smooth, to perform accurately even under rapid fire. To achieve this, they put each barrel through a cryogenic process holding them at temperatures 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. This refines the grain structure of the metal resulting in smoother performance and no bending or warping under heated conditions. All right, let's try some birds. Give you a couple singles and then warm you up, get you a double or two. All right. Pull. Other side. Pull. There you go. It has a fiber optic front sight. It has a center bead. I like two beads so that I can make sure that the gun's lined up on my face consistently. Pull. Skeet shooting first began in the 1920s as bird hunters invented a new way to improve their accuracy in the field. Soon, shooters were joining skeet and trap shooting clubs all over the United States. The art of exhibition shooting, which had begun in the late 19th century, was taken to a whole new level. Today, skeet and trap are still the best way to hone your skills. Whether you're hunting turkey, geese, or anything else with wings. Oh. What do you think about Da Vinci? You know, when I point, it, it shoots right there. Pull. Let's check out how it moves. All right. Ready? Pull. Pretty in line. Oh, you didn't have to do a whole lot of swinging. Pretty good. Let's crank this thing way over here. That ought to give you some swing time. All right. You ready? Ready? Pull. There you go. It swings really well. One of my buddies, yeah. he told me about the balance of the gun. Right. If the if the gun is barrel heavy, it's going to be really hard to swing. It's going to be like swinging like that, okay. right? But if the gun is really well balanced, and see how this is, yeah. pretty well balanced, yeah. the weight is in the middle. So now you can swing it with all the weight fall falling back this way instead of being out there. That makes the gun swing a little bit faster. There you got it. Yeah. Chris and I experimented with a few things. When you throw these two targets, man, I'm gonna try to see if I can't hit both of them with one shot and see if I can save a little ammunition. When you shoot one clay at a time, you can shoot it anywhere along its path. But when you're shooting two at a time, you have to shoot them in a specific area in the air. So you gotta time it pretty correctly. Whoa! <laughs> Ready? Ready. Shoot them both. Uh, let me see it No, first. Just, you don't waste All a right. shot now. We waste. Ready? All right. Boom. Yeah! yeah. There you go. <laughs> now, see, that's day. how you save ammunition. <laughs> what do they call it? Two birds with one stone? Two birds with one stone. <laughs> Two birds with one bullet. <laughs> All right, Jay. All right. So what do you think about the Vinci? Taking a look at the Benelli Vinci, I did like the balance of the gun. A very swingable gun, easy to move from target to target. And this particular gun fit my face well enough that I didn't have to make very big adjustments. All right, Jay, well, let's head on back over here and holler at Kobe, see what he's got going on. All right. We're testing three super shotguns, the M4, the Benelli Vinci, and the Nova Pump Shotgun. We'll get back to the range after these Top Gun's bullet points. The shotgun is a versatile weapon because it can fire many different loads depending on the intended target. A birdshot load fires hundreds of small pellets. 
They spread out, providing the greatest possibility of striking the aerial target. A buckshot load contains larger pellets. These projectiles have less spread, but provide more killing power. A slug load is just a solid chunk of lead. More accuracy is required, but takedown power is assured. These various loads are all packed into a wad that pushes them out of the barrel as the gunpowder ignites. There is only one shotgun left for ex-Marine Chris Reed and competitive shooter Jay Lim to examine. The Benelli Nova, a pump shotgun embraced by both hunters and marksmen. All right, Chris, we have one more Benelli. Yep. And this one is a pump, the Nova. The Benelli Nova is a standard pump action shotgun with a bad boy image. This weapon is light, strong, and has a capacity of five rounds, four in the magazine plus one in the chamber. It works equally well with birdshot, buck, or slugs. The polymer stock provides a secure grip, will not corrode, and is resistant to scratching or dents. The Nova can be easily taken down to its basic components for cleaning. It's an all-around rugged and reliable pump-action shotgun. The Nova is, of the three, it's totally unique operating system in which it is a pump gun. A pump. This gun, you pump it, and it's, it's a manual shot every time. And so you're going to feel You're going to feel the shot more just like a bolt-action rifle. There's no wasted gas. Everything's coming out of the end of the barrel until you cycle it. It's so practical and reliable. I mean, this thing, there's nothing to fail on it. There are no moving parts through the shot sequence. And well, Jay is waiting down at the range. Take the Nova down there. Once again, have some fun. I'm going to come down there a little later, and we're going to have a friendly little shoot-off. Good so deal. I'll see you in a bit. Yep. All right. Take it easy. The pump-action shotgun was first developed in 1882 by Christopher Spencer. Each pump placed another round in the chamber. With the trigger held, these older shotguns could be fired as fast as the pump moved back into place. This technique is called slam fire, and it helped to clear trenches in World War I. It was so effective that when used, the Germans accused the Americans of war crimes. Hey, man. What's happening, Jay? What you got there? Got a Benelli Nova that Mr. Kobe Donaldson sent us out here to play with. I don't know if you're familiar with pump shotguns or not. Surely you are. Yeah, I've shot this before. Everybody likes a shotgun, you know, with a little wood on it or whatever. This thing is is just about fully composite, everything but the barrel. And that's probably one of the most unique features about it. Benelli put out the Nova. The people on the market were so accustomed to their, their pretty wood shotguns, you know, and this thing was synthetic from start to finish. To me, it really doesn't matter because to me, a shotgun is a tool. It's been quite a few times where I've had to use a shotgun stock as a boat paddle, you know, to kind of get my boat across the, across the lake or the slough or whatever I'm doing. Uh, use it to push the boat, you know, when you get in, in the muddy bogs and stuff like that. I've dropped them over the side of the boat, you know, so you're getting them wet and muddy and nasty. The shotgun's good for three things, and it's boom, 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 you know. If it'll do that and, and beat off the occasional cotton mouth if you need it, then I think it's a good weapon. All right. So we rock and roll on eight rounds of pure death and destruction. Let's get to it. Let's go try it out. I had experience with a Nova platform, but I didn't have experience with the tactical version. What you gonna shoot at first? They done put us up some awesome targets out here. We got a 25, looks like probably a 50. I think we'll do the, uh, the 25 first. That'll work, that'll work. There you go. The recoil on pump shotguns is uh, significantly more than gas-operated uh, semi-automatic shotguns. Check out the wads are hitting it, too. Because there's no spent energy going into any other part of the gun other than backwards. Definitely had a good kick. You like working the old pump? <laughs> Liking the pump action. I hear you. Fire in a hole. The Nova shotgun, you know, we shot it at 25 yards. It did about what, it's, what was expected out of it. I tell you what, man, just for and giggles, shoot to 50. You gonna try All right. It? You gonna try it first? Slugs at 50 yards, no, no problem. Work. In a 40 mile an hour wind. 
the 50 yards with a slug shotgun set up in a tactical format, I mean, it's, it's not designed for accuracy. There you go. You can make it very accurate if you put a rifled barrel on it, but the way it was configured and, and the ammunition that I had to test with, 50 yards, you know, you're doing good to keep it in a six inch pattern. And that's perfectly effective at stopping people. So the scenario here is we've got a two-sided wall. I mean, it's just like a, a regular interior wall in somebody's house. We just shoot the bird shot at the wall board, see what kind of penetration we get. It'll also give you an idea with this short barrel, it should have a pretty good sized pattern on it. Then we'll shoot the buckshot, and then of course, I mean, there's no sense in even shooting a slug through it. We know what it's gonna do. Okay. So let's try the bird shot first and see what happens. Get to it. All right, let's see what happens. What do you think it's gonna do? You think it's gonna go through both seats? I think some of them might make it through. Jay and Chris will now test to see how far the Nova will penetrate a typical interior wall of a house when fired from 10 yards. Here we go. Well, pretty impressive. I think you got the wad stuck in the wall. Being able to shoot at it with birdshot was kind of fun. So like I said, we've still got about a two foot pattern to go all the way through both sheets. Some of them made it through. Yep. The second layer of sheetrock is knocked off the frame. We had just very few pellets to actually penetrate both layers. Let's try the buckshot, man. I bet we get a little different result. Now, we know that this is going to go through. Why don't you just try to demolish it? You read my mind. <laughs> Better clear back, buddy. You ready? What a shotgun is made to do. Nah. Can you say ouch? <laughs> <laughs> the buckshot, to say the very least, is devastating. I'd hate to have some shot in my ass. <laughs> so the bird shot would be a very tight quarters round that you could use, you know, such as in an apartment or, or in a in a house, interior rooms. And buckshot, you know, you may want to kind of pick your shots a little more carefully. All right, Jay. What do you think about the Benelli Nova? Very reliable. The action was really nice, didn't have a hitch at all. It is exactly what it was described to do. I think the Nova performed like it was supposed to perform. The evaluations are in for all three shotguns. The M4 military shotgun with brutal knockdown power had a strong showing. It was surprisingly more accurate than I expected. The Benelli Vinci lived up to its reputation as a reliable bird gun. I did like the balance of the gun. This particular gun happened to fit my face perfectly because uh, I was able to line up the beads without making very big adjustments. And the Benelli Nova proved effective and safe for home defense. I think the Nova performed like it was supposed to perform. Now it's time to hit the range and I'll review the weapons before we each take our best shot. Hey, fellas. Morning, Colby. How's it going, Colby? I'm doing good. All right, let's start with the M4. You guys have had some time behind the trigger on all three of these shotguns. Chris, let's start with the M4. Give me your impression. Colby, the M4, to me, it's an obvious choice for the United States Marine Corps. It's just an all-around practical shotgun if you're going to be clearing houses, clearing rooms. Tactical scenarios is exactly what it's built for, and it's a devastating machine. Jay Lim, what are your thoughts? Coming from a civilian point of view, this could definitely be good for home defense as well. Agree with Chris, the gun worked really well. Now Surprisingly look. accurate. Also, we'll really? throw that in there. That thing you guys is, shooting some slugs out of it? We did shoot some slugs, and it, it was. I think we were both impressed yep. with the accuracy. I was really so. impressed with the accuracy. Right on. Well, now it's my turn. Let's head over to the range. Gotta work. Out of the three guns, the M4 was the one I was most familiar with. I own this gun. But it's just one I've been shooting for years. So I knew I didn't need that much practice with it. Shoot the buckshot and just get, like I said, for me, I had to hold just a little bit high of center. And uh, it'll probably keep all nine pellets in the, in the paper. Safety on the rear. You got it. Colby had no problem. Colby's a shooter, you know. I mean, he's he's got a background with firearms. He's an old Texas boy, you know, from the farm. 
he was handling it like he was supposed to. He was able to operate it and, and get on target, probably just as good as me and Jay. We set up some bottles out there. Let's see what it'll do, see how quickly I can take those out. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Good old buckshot. I know Colby as a TV show host, never seen him shoot before, so it was really nice to see him out of context for once. And uh, for him to be shooting those little bottles at uh, 25 yards with uh, M4, yeah, it was pretty impressive. I'm convinced, I like it. The M4 didn't disappoint. It's super accurate and it has a ton of knockdown power. It's just a, a brutally destructive gun. All right, guys, moving from tactical to a bird gun. Chris, tell me what you think of the Vinci. The Vinci was touted to be one of the fastest cycling shotguns on the market, uh, also low recoil. It's a very lightweight. I feel very comfortable with it, taking it in the field, you know, duck hunting, dove hunting, things like that. I'm curious myself. I've, this is a gun I haven't ever used before, so I'm anxious to get some rounds downrange. And these three Benelli's, this was the only gun really set up to, uh, to shoot clay targets. Gentlemen, I might use all the pointers you can give me. It's been a while since I've uh, shot at some clay birds. Ain't no problem, man. It's all good. All right, hit the bottom. Hit the elevator release button. You got a little button right here. Okay. That little let one round go in the chamber. So we took it over. Jay and Chris had the whole setup. They had the launchers, and everything was good to go. All right, let's try it. Head down and focus on the bird. Got to tell you, I was a little nervous getting up there with that gun, simply because I had both those guys standing there watching me. Uh, and we started slinging birds immediately. Oh. Good shot. He's had experience shooting skeet before, but he said about 10 years ago, and that was only a couple of times. So when we threw the first one up there and he hit it, that was pretty impressive. Oh. Go. Want to try the one from the right? Sure. Oh. There you go. Right behind it the first time. It was behind it the first time? Yep. OK. Think about it like this. You got a shot string. You're not shooting it like with a single projectile. So if you're going to miss, go ahead and miss in front of it, and you got a good chance of the target running into the Catching pellets. Catching up. OK. All right, let's try two of them. Just for giggles. <sighs> Pull. Good. There you Woo! go. Nice. That'll work. Nice. All right. Well, that's fun. I could sit here all day and yeah, do that. Yeah. I was impressed with the Vinci. I mean, it's a super lightweight uh, bird gun, but that's what I shoot. That's what I hunt with, is a lightweight 12-gauge bird gun. We're cold. Good deal. Let's head on back, guys. Uh, man, it was fun, man. I just wanted to keep going. I didn't want to put that gun back. OK. Now we're switching to what could be the hybrid of the three, and also the only pump, the Nova. Jay, let's start with you. What are your thoughts? I think that is a very reliable gun, exactly what it was made to do. Chris Reed? 100%, man. It's the, it's the revolver of the shotgun world. This thing, there's very few moving parts, so it's going to work every time. It's consistent. It's very lightweight. And uh, surprisingly, man, you can pump that thing pretty fast. So I just about take on a, a, a semi-automatic with it. So it's, Really? It's a pretty cool gun. All right, let's take it over to the range. The Nova was the only pump shotgun out of the three. And it's been a while since I've worked a pump. That's what I learned to bird hunt with when I was a kid. Knock it out. The Nova for me was shooting a tad bit high, so I was kind of have to get my front sight post down just a little bit. Okay. I just lined up the, the dots and put it in the middle. Okay. And it happened to hit, so that's what I used. Yeah. Me and Kobe think alike, right? Yep. I see what you're saying. There you go. Good shot. You having to get the front sight down a little bit? Yeah, it is down. You're right. Well, this thing does pack a wallop, doesn't it? There you go. I mean, this thing is made to point and shoot. It's that simple. You bring it to your shoulder, you look down the top of the barrel, and you pull the trigger. Good shot. They're designed to be easy to hit stuff with. Were you right on, was your? Same, same, just about you, the same elevation. Really? You yeah. were low on, at 50? Yeah. And Jay, you were dead on? Dead on. He aimed dead center everything. <laughs> I'm gonna shoot this thing offhand. hand. 
I like the Nova. You know, the gun has a heck of a kick to it. But it's a 12 gauge, and this one was set up tactically, so it had a shorter barrel on it, had some good sights. Okay, that'll work. And so it kind of felt like an old bicycle, you know, getting back on the seat and, and taking it for a spin. See what this thing can do to some cinder blocks out at 25 yards. See how this thing hits it. When you've got the extended magazine, the shorter barrel, I mean, it's just time to wreak havoc. It's time to blow stuff up. Left to right, starting at the top. OK, so we, we put some slugs in it and set some cinder blocks out there. some fun with this. <laughs> That's bullseye. bad news right there. Anyway. Now that is bad news for who's ever standing on the other side of that cinder block wall. It just demolished cinder blocks at 25 yards. Let's go play. Let's do it. You know, that's what that gun's designed to do. So you might as well put it to the test doing what its intention was. Shotguns in some form have been in use for almost two centuries. This week's weapons are the result of 200 years of extensive research and field testing. The M4 shotgun, carried by the Marines and other military units worldwide. The Benelli Vinci Bird Gun, preferred by hunters for its smooth action and easy swing. The Benelli Nova Shotgun, a rugged pump action suitable for close quarters or bird hunting. Now that all the weapons have been put through their paces, it's time for us to take our best shot. Okay, gentlemen. So, now that we've had a chance to use all three of these guns, I promised you earlier we're gonna get to choose our best shot. First thing we're gonna do is flip a coin to establish who's gonna get which weapon, okay? I have three coins that are each red and blue. You guys take one of those. Real simple, odd man out gets to choose the weapon first. Ready? Red, red, blue. Jay, you get to choose first. I'll, uh, I'll take the Vinci. OK. Now, Chris, I'm going to flip this coin one more time. You call it in the air. Gotcha. And if it lands on your color, you get to choose. Otherwise, I choose. Got it? Red. It's blue. blue. OK. Jay's going with the Vinci. I know you like the M4, brother, so I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to yeah. take the pump. I'm going to take the Nova, see what kind of damage I can do with that. Jay, you won the toss, so you're going first, brother. Grab your weapon, let's do this. All right. I was hoping to get the Vinci so that I can show what it can really do. I think it's the uh, gun that suited me the best because that's uh, the discipline that I shoot. OK, so uh, I'm going to get throw two up. OK. And then after the last one, report, and then both of them. Gotcha. So for my exhibition shot, I decided to throw two and launch two out of the throwers. And that would use all four shells and give us multiple targets at multiple speeds. So four total. Yeah. All right. All right. Two hand thrown and two throwers. I don't think Jay wanted to stretch his muscles and get into the tactical world of shotguns at all. I think Jay was much more comfortable taking a gun out there, throwing some clay in the air, and see what he could hit it. That wind's blowing this way, too. Chunk them out. Good job, man. Good job, man. Thanks. Good work. I got to say, I was a little skeptical of Jay with the Vinci. And uh, first toss out there, throws him up in the air, takes all four of them out. I was impressed. Well, Chris, the pressure is now on me and you, buddy. We got to step up. Grab your right. gun, Jay. Let's head back. For the exhibition, you know, I was trying to think of something that was pretty impressive. I knew Jay was pretty good with the Da Vinci. And Kobe, you know, with the pump shotgun, you know, he was going to wreck house. Let's get the old M4 out. I just had them set up five water bottles at like 25 yards and then one out at 75 to show not only could this thing shoot fast, it was pretty accurate. I don't know as much as these guys do about guns, but I know a shotgun's not necessarily designed to take out a target at that range. Let's wreak some havoc. Let's go, boy. I can roll. I just try to have a good time with everything. You know, if I have a good day, that's cool. If I don't, you know, I ain't gonna beat myself up about it because I know I tried. All right, Chris, ready, set, go. Appreciate it, man. I think Chris Reed showed us exactly why he won top shot. 
It's funny, we weren't in a head-to-head -head competition, and yet you still feel pressure going into a situation like this, simply because it's bragging rights. You got your buddies there, you want to impress them, you want to shoot well. Colby set up eight plates and was loaded with buckshot with the Nova. You just have to remember that this thing is a manual action versus the semi-automatic. I gave Chris the M4, so he's using a semi-automatic shotgun. I'm using a pump action. There's no way I'm gonna be as fast as he is. I wanted to be able to transition that pump gun in a hurry. It was a bit foreign to try to not only take out my targets, but really be quick about it. You know, I, I gotta tell you, I wasn't all that confident. You ready? Sure. All right. Walk and ready! <laughs> Had to do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I love it. Go! <laughs> Going That's a good run, Colby. Good run. <laughs> so head back to your team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Colby said, uh, "I'm going to shoot through this as fast as I can." His execution of his uh, challenge was great. He went right through the plates, like he said. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. yeah. Good shooting, Colby. Well, wasn't as fast yeah. as the M4, but I got it done nonetheless. Good job, buddy. Good job. Working the pump. All right, guys. This was a no-lose situation for me. Regardless of which gun I ended up with, A, I was gonna have fun, B, I thought I was gonna be pretty effective with any of them. Well, guys, some great shooting today. Jay, I was impressed, man. Don't know if I could pull that off. And Chris, dude, talk about destruction. <laughs> M4's got it, don't you? Like I said, it's a gun I have. I've never attempted a shot that far, so that gives me a goal to set now, too. You Guys, go. I appreciate you coming on. Hey, Colby. That was some good shooting on your part, too, brother. Yeah, not bad for a TV show host. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of here. Good guys. job, buddy. <laughs> Being able to spend time with Chris Reed was a pleasure. Top Shot was a great experience, and this is uh, equally as, as unique. I did have a pretty good time out here. Nothing like a little California sunshine and get to see Kobe again and Jay Lim. Yeah, I really enjoyed myself. On this episode of Top Guns, pistols that pack a punch. Three Smith & Wesson firearms from the M&P 40 Cal, a well-respected weapon in law enforcement circles, to the rugged Model 625, proven to be one of the fastest shooting revolvers in the world to the iconic SW-1911, a new twist on a 100-year-old weapon design. Throughout history, weapons, both primitive and modern, have been essential for survival. Used on the field of battle, for hunting, law enforcement, and personal protection. As technology advances, rifles, shotguns, and pistols are continually improved to be more precise and effective. On every episode of Top Guns, experts and marksmen will delve into the history, mechanics, and design of these weapons. After being field tested, they will be featured in a shoot-off to determine which weapons truly are the top guns. On this episode, we're looking at Smith & Wesson pistols, and we've got the perfect weapons expert here to help. Julie Golub, how are you? Good, how are you? Good to see Good you. Good to see you. Growing up in New York, Julie Golub began her competitive shooting career at the age of 14. She enjoyed rifles and shotguns, but excelled with pistols. Before too long, she was winning local and regional competitions. Many awards followed over the last 20 years. She recently won her 12th national title in the U.S. Practical Shooting Association competition. Well, I can tell today is going to be all about handguns. What did you bring for us? This is the M&P 40 right here, Smith & Wesson Pro Series model. Right on. What else? All right. We've got uh, a lot of good stuff here. We have the model 625, 45 ACP. Another Smith & Wesson? Yes, and then we have a 9 millimeter 1911 Smith & Wesson. Very new to me. I have not seen that one. Let's start with the M&P 40. OK. Tell me a little bit about this gun. Basically, this was introduced in 2005, 
and it's an innovative polymer framed pistol built on the 40 caliber platform. The Smith & Wesson m and 40 is part of a long line of sidearms developed for law enforcement. Smith & Wesson began making ammunition and firearms in 1852. These handguns and cartridges became known throughout the West and even into Europe and Russia. As cities grew and crime became a problem, Smith & Wesson developed pistols for law enforcement. These became known as the m and models, military and police pistols. In 2005, Smith & Wesson unveiled their latest m and 40 caliber pistol. This model built on the storied history of Smith & Wesson firearms. Now in demand by law enforcement agencies, this pistol is made from lightweight polymer, and an indicator on top lets you know if there's a round in the chamber. It also features an enlarged trigger guard so it can be used with gloves. So the 40 caliber cartridge, that's one obviously very popular with police. The nice part about the 40 is it's a happy medium. It has the capability of more rounds in a magazine versus a 45, but it has a lot of stopping power as well. So you're kind of halfway in between your 9 millimeter, your 45. Exactly. The best of both worlds. Exactly. All right, Julie, let's bring in our shooters for today. Let's do it. Every week, we invite marksmen to the range to test the weapons and give us a practical perspective on these firearms. This week, we've got two. First, Maggie Reese. She's a professional sponsored shooter with multiple national and international titles under her belt. She's been competing in shooting sports for 13 years and is equally comfortable with rifles, shotguns, or pistols. Hi. Might look familiar to you. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Hi, Maggie. How are you? All right, first of all, this is the first time we've ever had two females on Top Gun, so I don't want any cat fighting between you. Oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> Maggie. We're going to exclude you, if anything. Yeah. No, no, I don't want that either. I want to be included on everything. Let's bring in our other shooter, Brad Ingman. Born and raised in San Francisco, Brad started shooting at the age of 13. Now he regularly competes in the United States Practical Shooting Association. He recently placed eighth overall in the 2011 USPSA Nationals and won his division at the 2011 Steel Challenge World Championship. What's up, Brad? How you doing, mm -hmm. sir? Good to see you. Well, you and Maggie are going to get to field test all three of these handguns. Julie, take Maggie and Brad down to the range. And remember, we're ultimately going to have a friendly little shoot-off, so you need to take advantage of this practice time. All right, nice. Sounds good. All See right. you later. <laughs> Our marksman and expert will test all three weapons. Then I'll join them on the range for a friendly shoot off. First up, the MP40. My first encounter with the MP40 was actually in a match when I had to pick up the gun and shoot it for the first time, and I actually fell in love with it. I was shocked at, at how soft shooting it was and how reliable it was for a polymer frame gun. So we have the MMP40 pistol here today. This is actually a five inch model, the Pro Series MMP40. And basically you have a longer sight radius, which is ideal for competition shooters and a lot of people who like longer sights to make more accurate shots. This is also a striker fired pistol, which means all of the safeties are internal. So it mm -hmm. makes it very easy to just pick up the gun when you're ready to shoot, it's ready to go. Traditional pistols go bang when the hammer strikes the bullet primer. That, in turn, ignites the gunpowder. But the m and 40 works on a different mechanical design, a striker fire. A striker is basically a spring-loaded firing pin instead of a traditional hammer. The striker is housed in the slide on top of the gun. This firing pin strikes the bullet. You want to shoot it? <laughs> Let's shoot do it. it. Let's uh, see how it groups for you guys. OK. All right. Cool. Let's do it. I don't really have any experience with the MMP 40 cal. Um, I actually don't have any experience with striker fire guns in general, so this should be really interesting to get to shoot it. Woo, nice. I think Maggie's pretty good with this gun, huh? What's wrong with that? Yeah. Visually, looking at the gun, I really like it. It has a solid feeling in my hands. It's got the long sight radius, which I know will be an advantage. There was a lot of muzzle rise and a lot of muzzle flip, um, but nothing that couldn't be manageable. Hold on to that gun. Yeah. Keep pulling the trigger. Yep. I like it. It works. Great. You wanna you wanna show us something? <laughs> uh, well, I'm very experienced with the MNP40. Uh, I shoot a nine millimeter version of it in competition, so it's pretty much the same gun. The only difference is that this one's a 40 cal and mine's a little bit uh, narrower in a bullet diameter. 
a little low that time. Okay. There we go. Nice. Right in the money. Very good. In comparison to the 9mm, the 40 uh, tends to have a lot more kick. So it snaps a little bit for you. A little bit of pop on those 40s, but uh -huh. I'm having a good time. Yeah, I like it. Very good. Well, let's, uh, let's shoot some fun stuff. Yeah. After getting a feel for the M&P on paper, the team moves on to some more lively targets, always evaluating the M&P's performance. Basically, we have a steel target, which you're familiar with, uh -huh. um, and then we have five cool. jugs full of water. Have you ever like shot? Uh... Nope. So this is a 40 caliber, so it's going to probably be pretty impressive when it shoots this. Fire when ready. <laughs> Woo! Little low. There you go. Oh, awesome. Cool. I like it. I like it. look pretty badass, Maggie. It's quite a dramatic display when those targets get hit on. <laughs> That's awesome. Like All right. It. So, Brad, uh, what are you thinking? You want to shoot this? I was thinking, uh, I don't know, uh, any chance we might be able to do a little bit of movement here? I think Brad definitely wanted to show off some skills, and it was a great opportunity. We set up a little course of fire that really featured what the MMP can do. How about this? In order to really feature this gun and how fast you can track the sights on it, shoot three on this steel target from this position. From in between this table and the next table, I'll have you actually shoot on the move at these five targets. That's an advanced skill right there, no pressure. And then we'll end up on this table here, and you'll shoot three on this target. Now, this is a high capacity 40, 40 caliber, so you'll have you'll have plenty of rounds if you well, don't I miss. I hope I'll have enough rounds. All right. I'm going to start throwing rocks at another one. <laughs> what do you think, Maggie? I have faith. I have faith. You can do it. All right. Well, well, let's see. All right, let's do it. I decided to push myself a little bit. Um, I like shooting stuff that, that's uh, that's fun and challenging. And you, know, you put a bunch of big targets and water jugs out in front of me, and I'll, I'll try to do whatever I can. Shoot already. Oh. Ah, <laughs> jump in the gun. Jump in, jump in. <laughs> Shoot already. Stand by. Go. Yeah, it was fun times. It's a fantastic gun. I think the ergonomic features of it definitely set it above a lot of the other guns out there on the market. The way the gun sits in your hand, it really is quite manageable, and you're able to shoot pretty quickly without having to worry too much about the recoil, even with a high-velocity load. Uh, it also involves an ambidextrous uh, slide release and an ambidextrous mag release. So at the end of the day, it's a fantastic pistol. How about you, Maggie? I'm with Brad. Yeah. High capacity just blows away. <laughs> I like it. I like that idea. Yeah. We've already looked at the Smith & Wesson M&P 40 Cal. Next up is the Model 625 Revolver. But before we get back to the range, a Top Gun's bullet point. The term pistol or handgun refers to a class of weapon designed to be held and fired in one hand. There are several varieties. The single-shot pistol can only be shot once before reloading. Multi-barreled pistols. Gunsmiths invented ways to provide multiple shots before reloading. Revolvers. Inventors fed ammunition into a single barrel using a revolving cylinder. And finally, the semi-automatic or automatic pistols. These guns use spent gases and recoil energy from a spent round to cycle a fresh bullet into place. Results are in from the M&P 40 test. Brad found it to be... It's a fantastic gun. I think the ergonomic features of it definitely set it above a lot of the other guns out there on the market. Next top gun to field test, the Smith & Wesson Model 625. Let's move on to the revolver. Yes. The Smith & Wesson 625. High caliber guns never go out of style, and versions of this revolver have been in service since Smith & Wesson began. They came out with their first single action revolver in 1857, Model 1. It held seven rounds and was the first revolver to use cased bullets instead of loose powder. Many new designs and innovations followed. The most recent, Model 625 with a six round cylinder, updates the action and styling of the original Smith & Wesson revolvers. The barrel is heavier, and the butt has been rounded in shape to provide a better grip. The heavier steel frame absorbs more of the recoil, 
giving the shooter more control. This is a, a big player in the competition market simply because uh, it's very easy to reload. Right. The full moon clip that basically just hooks all of those cases in place and you just literally drop, close, and go. Really? It can be very fast. Did you bring some of those with you? I did. Okay, good. You have to teach me how to use <laughs> I will those. do that. I like it. All right, Julie. All right. Take the Smith & Wesson 625. You guys go back down to the range. I'll see you later. Right. We'll see you in a bit. With revolvers, two actions are required to fire a bullet. Number one, the cylinder must rotate to bring a new cartridge in line with the barrel. Number two, the hammer must be released to slam against the bullet primer. The Model 625 can be fired using either a single action or double action. With a single action, the shooter must cock the hammer back manually, which brings a live cartridge in line with the barrel. The trigger is ready to fire, and pressure from the finger will release the hammer to fire the bullet. With a double action, the shooter simply pulls back on the trigger. This longer trigger pull brings the hammer back, lines up the new cartridge, and releases the hammer to slam into the bullet. You can shoot more accurately using the single action, but you can shoot faster using double action. I'll probably maybe shoot three shots double action, three shots single action. Absolutely. This see is just to get good. used to the gun and, okay. and see how it feels for you. I think it's important to shoot both uh -huh. so you have an idea of where your sights are hitting. No, I don't really have hardly any uh, background with revolvers, but coming out here today and picking up that Smith & Wesson, I was surprised. It felt good in my hand. It's solid, um, good grip on it, a good weight to it, and it, it seems to be a gun that I might actually like. OK, you're a little bit to the right. Yeah. <laughs> Try to take your time as much as possible during that shot. That's a very long trigger pull. Yes, a little high. OK, now go ahead and try single action. Yeah? Yeah, just give it a try to make sure that it's, it's dialed there in it for you. Yep, there you go. There you go. Shooting a little bit to the right for you. The recoil was very manageable. Um, despite the fact that it's a 45, the Smith & Wesson, it's, it's a heavy gun, and so it, it absorbs that recoil very well. Very nice. I'm stopping. <laughs> I am stopping right there. I hit the center. Done. <laughs> Got my bullseye put the gun down, I'm done. <laughs> you know, when it's in, it's in, and then I'm done. Fire when ready. All right. We do a few single action first. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> I was able to hit the target single action. It was a very crisp trigger, so you barely breathe on the thing, and it goes off. That's an awesome group, Brad. Really awesome. Yeah, but try some double. Let me know if I'm doing anything wrong I here. I will, I will. You look like you're doing great. All right, you are shooting to the right as well. That long trigger pull is definitely finicky. Both Maggie and Brad stay on target better with a single action. But with double action, because it's such a long pull, and there's a tendency to move the sights at the very last moment before that shot's fired. There you go. That was a great shot in the center. Good job. We're going to head up to the 10-yard uh, line here. OK. Can you show us how it's done, Julie? Oh, uh, would you like me to? <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right. We uh, had a really fun challenge. We set up three steel targets, and we decided to shoot two on each of them, reload, and then shoot two on each of them once more. All right, who's going to say, ready, set, go for me? You All right, I'll, I'll do it. All yeah. right. Are you ready? All right. Stand by. Go. Nice. Ah! <laughs> so uh, obviously I had one miss there at the end, which is a little frustrating, and I, I screwed up my reload. So I think one of you guys could probably take me on this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Who's going to do it? You want to go first? I'll try. I'll OK, try. let's do it. Julie's definitely a solid, solid shooter, so I had high expectations for her, and she okay. delivered on that. Um, she was really able to go up and, and show us the proper technique for holding the gun, so I felt good watching her. Stand by. Go. Oh, my gosh. Two misses on that run. Oh my so god! So I think I gotcha. Oh my god! But I think All Brad. Right. I think Brad might. Uh... All right, we'll see how this goes. Okay. okay. Stand by. 
Stand by. Go. Ah. Still got one left in there. Nice finish. Way to finish that Good strong finish. Good job. Yeah, I missed a couple. What do you guys think? Well, it's different. I like it, though. I'm surprised that I like it. But it's so different from anything else that I've shot. Smith & Wesson revolvers are known for being super reliable, because I think with the single action in that gun, you're going to be able to put rounds down range with incredible precision. Uh, the 625 actually didn't have a great deal of recoil, even though it was shooting a high uh, velocity, really heavy cartridge like the 45 ACP. So even though you had a lower grip, the recoil was still not super significant. I thought it was a really fantastic gun to shoot. I think it's safe to say, though, the biggest challenge is the double action. Definitely. Accuracy. Definitely overcoming that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we had a Top Gun challenge, do you think uh, maybe that would be the... the I'm, I'm terrified of the double action. <laughs> <laughs> then let's do it. All right, let's yeah. do it. We're testing three Smith & Wesson pistols, the M&P 40, the 45 Cal Model 625, and the 1911 N9mm. But first, a Top Gun's bullet point. In the 19th century, Henry Derringer designed a very small firearm nicknamed the pocket pistol, or palm pistol. It fired a single shot and was loaded from the muzzle. Henry's Philadelphia Derringer was copied by many other gun makers. Initially popular with military officers, Soon, civilians carried them, and they were also favored by assassins. The most famous Derringer put to this use was fired by John Wilkes Booth in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Back on the range, national pistol champion Julie Gollett, competitive shooter Maggie Reese, and pistol expert Brad Ingman continue to test the Smith & Wesson pistols leading up to a final shoot-off. Brad's evaluation on the Model 625 put the weapon in a positive light. The 625 actually didn't have a great deal of recoil, even though it was shooting a high-velocity, uh, really heavy cartridge like the 45 ACP. So even though you had a lower grip, the recoil was still not super significant. Up next, the classic model 1911 with a modern twist, a barrel configured to fire the 9mm round. All right, Julie, last but not least, we have one more Smith & Wesson. This is a 9mm 1911, and it hasn't been until very recent history that manufacturers have been able to make a 1911 that shoots 9mm reliably, and Smith & Wesson is a leader in that, so. They figured it out. They figured it out. This intriguing firearm builds on a rich history of the semi-automatic pistol known as the Model 1911. In the early 1900s, the U.S. Army needed a pistol with knockdown power. Gun designer John Browning proposed a new single-action semi-automatic weapon that could fire a 45 caliber round and had a new internal design. As the bullet is fired, expanding gases push the bullet forward, eject the spent casing, and put a fresh bullet into the chamber. Adopted in 1911, the pistol was the U.S. Army standard issue for 74 years. It was also adopted by the Navy and the Marines. It saw action in World War I, World War II, and continued to be used throughout Vietnam. 20 years after being retired from military service, engineers at Smith & Wesson adapted the Browning design and reconfigured the barrel to accept a smaller 9mm bullet. Today, the SW-1911 is used for target shooting, competition, and for those who love this iconic design in soft shooting 9mm. This gun actually has 10 rounds. And there's also a big desire to have a 9mm 1911 because 9mm is very inexpensive. It's a lot cheaper to take to the range. It is. Obviously, this gun is going to have less recoil yes. than a standard 1911. Yes. Julie, Brad, and, and Maggie are waiting down at the range. You take the Pro Series 1911 down there. Here's your mag. All you right. guys have some fun. Thanks. I'll join you in a bit. Will do. What's unique about this particular 1911 today is that it's chambered in 9mm. It's taken years of development to get a 9mm to run accurately in a single stack 1911 frame. Arm wrestle. Oh, you want to arm wrestle yeah. me? And I love to shoot it because it shoots so soft. It's, it's like it's cheating when you're shooting it. <laughs> <laughs> 
What is going on here? She's a cheater. What do you want me to do? What was this contest about? I don't know. I, she's been shooting first all the time. I want to have my own run. But I win. I win every time. Well, I think Maggie yeah. won. It was clear. I'm sorry, yeah. Brad. I know. Yes, yes, uh, the arbitrator right here. You can go first. You can go first. So what we have here is wonderful 1911. Excellent. Mm -hmm. You guys familiar with this gun? Mm -hmm. I've seen maybe one or two before. <laughs> okay. Nice features about this gun is that the front back strap has some checkering on it to help you to control recoil. We've got ambidextrous safety, so you can activate the safety with either your left or right thumb. We've got uh, low profile sights, magazine release button, and of course a nifty little magwell right out of the box. Mm -hmm. Good stuff, huh? I'm very familiar with the 1911 and how it works and so forth. Uh, just the fact that it's chambered for nine is a little bit of a novelty for me, but it's a fortunate one because it's a really soft recoiling gun and you can just pound away the target as much as you like. Nice. I think you got it. Good job. What do you think? That's pretty dead on. Yeah, it looks, looks like it to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maggie, you want to go ahead and yeah. go to where I'll... All right, yeah. go ahead. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm stopping right there. <laughs> no, just kidding. Good. Because we're shooting this Smith and Wesson 1911 in a nine, the recoil is is so soft. Um, it's really easy to absorb and control, and so just even sighting in the gun, um, it's just a great shooting gun. Nice job, like Maggie. Very, good. Very good. good. All right. So we shoot some other stuff. Absolutely. In this next challenge, cardboard targets are placed at three different distances. Marksmen will need to move quickly between targets, reacquire the sight picture, and fire accurately. So what we're going to do is we'll have you shoot two on each of the targets from near to far. So center, left, and right. OK, nice All right. controlled burst. Yeah. All righty. All right. Stand by. Go. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. So, so. do you want to give it a roll? Oh, yeah, let's load up some more. All right, so what we'll have you do is we'll have you shoot two on each of the target, any order that you want. Okay. Reload off the table, drop down, and shoot from underneath the table and nice. shoot two on each. Nice. I think you should timer for it. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> idea. Awesome. Let, let, let me grab one out. Can okay. you handle the pressure? Oh. <laughs> I can think you could break into the eights. All right. Go ahead and load make ready. Okay. Are you ready? Stand by. A 750, uh, your first shot was under half a second. And your reload was sub two second reload. Nice, Maggie. very nice. nice. Maggie really surprised me. To go ahead and do a, a speed reload like that immediately, I, I was definitely impressed. She's got some very impressive shooting skills and gun handling skills. Definitely, I think that Magwell is going to come into play huge here. I mean, it's a huge advantage over some of the Did other guns. Did you find guns. it a lot easier yeah. to reload this gun? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. OK. I would be pleased to shoot the 1911 in the challenge. Um, it's a semi-automatic can gun. I'm familiar with it. I can do reloads pretty quick with it. I can drive the gun pretty fast as well. It's a really light recoiling gun, uh, much less so in comparison to the 40 and the 625. So generally, all around, I'd be perfectly happy to, uh, to shoot it. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. So far on this episode of Top Guns, three Smith & Wesson pistols have been tested. The M&P 40 caliber, giving police the added firepower of a high capacity 40 cal weapon. The Model 625, a double action revolver with 45 caliber stopping power. And finally, the SW 1911, a classic design updated with nine millimeter ammo. Now it's time for me to hit the range and review the weapons before the shoot-off. I want to get as much info from those guys as I can because they've got some trigger time on each one of the weapons. Hi, gang. How you doing, Colby? How are you guys doing? <laughs> Good. Did my ladies get along OK? Of course, this? of course. Yeah? Julie, I know how familiar you are with the MMP40, but this is a gun I haven't ever used, so I definitely want to get some trigger behind this. Let's go to the range. First gun I pulled off the gun rack was the Smith & Wesson MMP40 caliber. Now, I've shot some 40 caliber guns, and I've shot some Glocks, which have a similar platform design, but I've never used the MMP. Well, moment of truth here, guys. Nice. 
That looks pretty good. Perfect. Uh, I like it already. <laughs> <laughs> then stop and, right there. <laughs> maybe I ought to stop right there, Maggie. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Shoot some fun now. Shoot some fun. The Maggie Reese school of thought. Uh, you want to shoot some steel there and see how uh, fast this thing you can make this thing work? I don't know. I gotta say, this is the first time I've ever been nervous. I don't know whether it's because you two women are here or because I have three experts here. Well, we're not gonna do it for time, but Brad, give me a. Uh, I'll start from the low ready. You give me a count. All ready? Are you ready? Stand by. Go. Excellent. There you go. Hey. Okay. Can't believe you didn't want a, a clock on that. That's pretty speedy. <laughs> uh, no, but you know what I do want? We got hollow points here. Uh, we can do some damage with these. That we can. You want to blow something up? I, I want to shoot something. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in fact, there's a jug right there. <laughs> it does not need to be on that post any longer. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Nice. nice. That uh, is a whole lot of fun. Yes. So we started things off on the right foot. Yeah. Now let's go over to the revolver, shall yeah. we? Yeah. All right. As soon as I grabbed the, the Smith & Wesson 625 revolver off the rack, I knew I was going to like it. I mean, yes, this is a big gun, but the grip feels good. I like the weight of the frame and the barrel on this gun. It is a man's gun, make no mistake. There you, there go. you go. That's nice. nice. <laughs> walking them in, walking them in. For people who aren't familiar with revolvers, who don't do a lot of revolver shooting, the 625 can actually be kind of an intimidating gun. But when Colby picked up that 625, that gun was made for him. I mean, he definitely should be a revolver shooter. Excellent. I'd say it's a pretty good group, Colby. That's, I like it. I like it. <laughs> OK, now here's what I want to do. I know this may be crazy, but since I shot the steel with the m and 40, and that's, you know, we should all be pretty quick with it. Mm. Semi-automatic like that. I want to do it with the revolver. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I do that? Do you want to? Do you want to have a timer on this one? Uh. Yeah. Sure. Why not? <laughs> All right. Let me. I'll do it. And I guess double action is the way you guys would do this in competition or something. Uh, yeah. yeah. That timing of you flipping back the the hammer is just going to take too much time. Okay. Cool. Let's try it. Load and make ready. Okay, here's a dumb question for you guys. <laughs> in this position, what should my starting position be with the gun? Start low ready. Right. Then try not to move anything else as you bring the gun up to the target. The same position that you want to shoot in. You don't want to have to adjust your body afterwards. Yeah, just your hands move. <sighs> All right, let's try it once. Are you ready? Stand by. Yeah. What was that, sub two? 204. Ah. 204. Can you what, get sub yeah, two? one more. Come on, you sub got two? it. Can you sub do two it? seconds. I don't six know. Six shots in under two seconds. This might be a, a world record. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Colby record. Oh, uh, yeah. It's the personal best. How about that? <laughs> OK. All right, let's do this. Are you ready? Stand by. Did it go under two? 196. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, six shots in sub two seconds. I mean, that's really good. I mean, people spend a long time training for that. And for him to walk up to the line and just kind of almost cold pick it up and do it is, is pretty impressive, really. What else did you guys do when you field tested this thing? When I talked to Julie, Maggie, and Brad about what they had done in their field test of the 625 revolver, I was a little bit surprised to learn they actually did some speed work with that thing. They're engaging steel, double tapping on three different steel targets, and then reloading and, uh, and engaging them again. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is going to be ugly. All right, I'll do it. But Julie, will show me, give me a quick rundown on the reload of this thing, how to do it quick. Absolutely. Yeah. So essentially, you'll have your spent cases in like so. You're going to push forward on the release, push this out let them drop on the ground, and you'll have this stage. So all you have to do is pick it up, drop it in, close it, make sure it catches, and you're okay. ready to go. So the gun stays in my strong hand? It does. OK. All right. All right, let's try this. This all is right. really fun. 
We'll have you start at the low ready, so you're ready to go to shoot two on each. We'll perform that blazing fast reload, and then re-engage them with two on each. All right. Are you ready? Stand by. Very nice, very nice. What was the time? 7.55. I'll tell you what, you're shooting this gun very, very Julie, well. Julie, you may not be leaving with this gun. <laughs> I may find a way to talk you out of this one. All right, guys, we have one more left. Let's get to it. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, and finally, a version of something we're all very, very familiar <laughs> with, the 1911, but this one's chambered in 9mm. This is one I'm excited to shoot. This one I've been looking forward to, so let's head on over to the firing line. Now, I love the 1911. Absolutely love that gun. I've never shot one with a 9mm, and I like it with chambered in 45 caliber, but I was curious to see if I was gonna like the 9mm as much. Oh, the recoil is so nice on that. <laughs> Immediately, my first couple of shots on paper, you just notice the, the, the absence of recoil. Oh, that is sweet. This thing allows follow-up shots unbelievably quick because the muzzle's not rising. It's not over the place. You're not having to manhandle that 1911 like you would a traditional 45 caliber 1911. Wait a minute. Did you guys put that pool ball over there? Look at that. You're hitting that, that X-ring center. That's easily <laughs> double, triple, quadruple the size. I mean, you want to intimidate a marksman. You put a billiard ball out there and say, OK, shoot that off a fence post. Just a little low. Oh, damn it. It's a little high. Oftentimes, when you're trying to make a precision shot, it's virtually impossible to hold the gun absolutely 100% still. There's going to be some movement, some swing, you know, a little bit of an arc that comes through. And as a shooter, you've got to be able to deal with that and compensate for it. If you try and keep it really tight, it, it's just not going to work for you. At that point, it's just nerves. I mean, I was just trying to calm myself down, focus on my breathing to get really, really accurate. It's a tough shot. You can do it, though. Do you want us to turn around? We won't watch. No, no. Okay. OK. okay. Oh, wow. I'm not going to do any better than that, so I'm going to stop <laughs> right there. That, that was an amazing Absolutely. shot. Absolutely. Uh, love the gun. All right, guys, here's the deal. We're going to have a little exhibition, friendly little shoot off. We'll flip a coin to see who ends up with what weapon. Ready? All right. As long as there have been pistols, marksmen have tried to outshoot each other. In trick shooting, performers attempt various feats with unusual targets, sometimes with little danger at it. They shoot multiple targets with a single bullet, fire the gun blindfolded, attempt to hit a series of targets from the hip, or with the pistol upside down. Normally, they don't shoot head to head, but once an amazing feat has been done, others try to best it. They make it all look easy, but their accuracy is the result of thousands of hours of practice. Now that all the weapons have been put through their paces, it's time to select a pistol and load up for the shoot-off. So here's what we have to do now. We're going to flip coins, blue on one side, red on the other. Maggie, Brad, you guys each have one. OK. Odd man out gets to choose their weapon and name their best shot. Let's go. Blue. Whose was Blue. that, Maggie? Yes. OK, Maggie, you get to choose first. 1911. Yes. OK. Mm -hmm. So now it's between me and you, Brad. I'm going to flip a coin. You call it in the air. Red. It's blue, which means I get to choose. The M&P 40 or the 625 revolver. All right, Brad, I know you love the M&P 40. <laughs> it also just happens to work out that I'm a big fan of this revolver now. So 
You take the 40 caliber. I'm going to take the 45. Thank you, Colby. How's that? OK. So, Maggie, there's your 1911. Thank you. Brad, you picked Thank your poison. You, sir. I'm going to take the revolver. Let's head over to the range. Let's do this. All righty. Well, now that I've had some trigger time with all three handguns, it's time to have a little exhibition. Break out the revolver. All right, let's do it. I really wanted to focus on accuracy, and it is more difficult to be accurate with that gun. So I decided to put three uh, different sized targets up there, increase the difficulty with each shot, and see if I could pull it off. Beautiful. Bowling pin. So after my exhibition, I wanted Brad and Maggie to come up with the best shot that they felt they could accomplish. It could be anything. We've got open parameters here. But I wanted the shooters to come up with something interesting. All right, Brad, tell me what you're going to pull off here. Well, what I'm going to attempt here is uh, we have four bowling pins downrange. we got a big old 18 by 24 piece of steel. We had a couple of tiny little clays. So what I'm going to try to do is pick up a gun. I'm going to load it to capacity 15 plus 1. Then I'm going to engage the four uh, bowling pins, try to knock them over. Then between these two tables, I'm going to put five rounds in that steel plate. And then when I arrive at that table, I'm going to see if I can't knock off all those uh, clay pigeons over there. I like it. Let's do it. Go ahead and load and make ready. OK. You know, I think this challenge was right up Brad's alley. He is such a, a, a good shooter in the sense that he's able to shoot quickly and accurately, but also move at the same time. So this challenge was perfect for him. Are you ready? Stand by. Nice. <laughs> We're clear. Nice job. Very nice. Brad. Maggie. Yes. Pressure's on. All right. It is your turn. Let's do this. Got your gun ready to go. All right, Maggie. Tell me what your shot's going to be. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot all the blue plates first. Going to do a reload off the table, shoot the red plates, and then I'm going to have my steel as a stop. All right. Let's see it. Give me a nod when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? Stand by. Hit. Hit. Nice. There you go. Yeah. Nice. 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 <laughs> a girl. Thank you. Awesome nice load. Work. Thank you. Thank you. Smoking. But Julie, don't think I'm letting you get out of here. How about you come up here and take on all three of them for us? I think I could Show do Show us that. a little something, will you? Know, yeah, I could, I could do something. Come on up. It just didn't seem right to bring Julie all this way, knowing how good she is and how proficient she is with all three of these handguns, not to give her the stage and let her show us how to really do it. OK, Julie, tell us what you're going to pull off here. All right, so I've got eight bowling pins here. I'm going to shoot four with the M&P 40. And then I'm going to switch over to the Smith & Wesson Pro Series 9mm 1911 for the other four, and then finish up with the revolver double action on that small steel target. Trifecta. <laughs> I yes. like it. Three handguns. Let's see it. All right. Clear to load? Clear to load. The greatest challenge for me was going to be picking up the gun quickly, acquiring the sight picture, making sure I had a great grip on the gun because it wasn't started in my hand, picking it up, shooting the targets, setting it down safely, and then going through onto the next gun and the next gun. OK. Shooter ready? ready. Stand by. Go. Guys, I want to thank all three of you. I think it is safe to say Smith & Wesson is building some unbelievable handguns these days. Julie, thanks for coming on. Maggie, <laughs> Brad, as always, it was a pleasure. I had a fantastic time. I was really happy to, to uh, get an opportunity to come out and do a little shooting. I mean, hey, if anybody wants to invite me to go shoot their ammo, I'm more than pleased to do it. You know, it's good to come back and get to shoot and, and play around and, and have the lighthearted nature of it all. 
I had a blast. Thank you. We'll see you guys down the road. Cool. Awesome. Right. Thanks. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. It's always fun to shoot Smith and & Wessons, and I think we, we shot them up pretty good here.